Back on July 13th this year, I got an email from a former Jehovah's Witness named Savannah. I'll share a bit of her story at the end of this episode in the updates. She told me about how the Jehovah's Witnesses encourage the terrible practices of disfellowship and shunning, how they destroy families, how they turn a blind eye towards rape and child abuse, how there is this crazy two-witness rule that allows for so, so much abuse to go unpunished. I was shocked by what Savannah was writing. I knew almost nothing about Jehovah's Witnesses, other than that they were mostly known for bothering people by showing up at their door to spread the good word. Other than that, I had not heard anything negative about them. So I started Googling, looking around, could not believe how many documentaries and exposés about them there are out there, how many former witness support group websites there are, how many websites there are devoted to tracking their alleged lies and nefarious deeds. So I told Savannah that I hoped I would get to this topic soon. Then I put the witness on a topic list that we keep here for, you know, possible future episodes. And then before I plan to get to the witnesses, our Patreon space lizard listeners voted this topic in. And after having finished the research, I'm so glad they did. I hope I have exposed them properly, Savannah. I feel like I did my best. And now I hope this becomes our most downloaded episode ever. I want so many others to hear who they really are. What I found blew me away. Oh my heck. Today we explore the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were born out of the late 19th century Bible students movement, which was born out of the early 19th century Adventism movement. And they really can't wait for Armageddon. The main thrust of their belief system is that the end of the world is imminent and that only Jehovah's Witnesses will be saved. And to be a Jehovah's Witness, you have to dedicate dozens of hours a month to evangelizing. That's where all the knocking on doors comes from. You must proclaim the truth. You must let others know the end of the world is near and the time to repent is now. To be a witness, you'll have to live by a strict and frankly insane moral code. You'll have to follow all the teachings of the Witness Headquarters official publication, The Watchtower, follow a variety of nonsensical practices like refusing to take a blood transfusion, even if it's necessary for you to live or join the military or hold any government office or salute the flag or vote or wear pants that are too tight. Not even kidding about that last one. If the leaders of the witnesses had their way, they would literally be a separate theocratic society. Very much like Gilead from The Handmaid's Tale with their own rules and legal procedures governed by nothing more than misguided notions of God's word. Today, we look into the history of this group of over 8 million current believers. We look into their beliefs, into their many, many failed end times predictions. We look into a massive Jehovah's Witness scandal. They may be hiding the biggest list of known but unprosecuted sexual predators ever compiled. All this and more on an apocalyptic, watch out for invisible Jesus. How can a supposedly godly group justify so many blatantly evil acts Open their eyes, Nimrod, and let them see the fucking truth edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Rejoice, for the end of the world is not near. Ignore the pamphlets. Ignore the hype. Hail Nimrod, beautiful Lucifina, open the witness's eyes to the glory of human sexuality. Praise Bojangles. Glory be to Triple M. Sing some freedom. Shine some sweet freedom into their troubled ear holes. Michael motherfucking McDonald. A big day here in the Suck Dungeon. I'm recording this on Friday, September 17th. And two days from now, September 19th, will mark the five-year anniversary of Time Suck. All this craziness started on September 19th, 2016. Have not missed a Monday yet, and for that I am thankful. Interesting that the first episode was about a conspiracy. The Lizard Illuminati. That was so fringy back in 2016. Not long after that episode, I did a JFK episode. I got a lot of shit from people uh, for entertaining the possibility that the CIA may have helped kill JFK for that uh, for entertaining that conspiracy. Many people still considered conspiracies to be crazy, and I think most are, but my oh my, how conspiracies have become so much more mainstream in the last five years. Not a good thing. Critical thinking, which I try to apply to every topic, needed now more than ever. With enough critical thinking, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I think they just go away. Their beliefs do not hold up too well when you apply reason to them. Religion. Is religion to blame for the recent rise in conspiracies? I would argue that, yeah, it is actually. Flat Earth Theory, Hollow Earth Theory, QAnon, Pizzagate, Fear of the Illuminati, it all traces back directly to religion. It's the common denominator amongst all these things. It comes up over and over and over again. So how do we reverse this trend? We focus on facts, science, critical thinking. We push for a bigger separation of church and state. 
I hate hearing politicians even mention God because no one can agree on what or who God is, what God supposedly has said. God's a moving target whose nature and will we meet sacks will never agree on. God is a target that moves a lot more wildly than any scientific empirical evidence-based target. If we don't ground our government in reason and science, I think our culture, culture will devolve into a cesspool of ignorance and chaos. You want to believe in religion? Fine. Fine. You want to incorporate it into our educational system or political decision-making? Not fine. Unless you want something akin to the Jehovah's Witnesses in charge. You know, and after today's research, I doubt that's something you'll be interested in. I hope you keep listening, Meat Sacks. I hope for the next five years, I can keep trying to make you laugh, help you learn, promote some reason in what seems sometimes to be an increasingly unreasonable world. Hail Nimrod, you beautiful bastards. Let's keep this shit going. A couple very quick announcements and then very excited for today's show. I found this so fascinating. I hope you do too. I uh, got some anniversary merch in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Got a sweet zip-up jacket that looks like what my jacket would look like if I were to graduate from Time Suck University to celebrate five years. Letterman's jacket vibes, uh, full of references to early characters. Triple M on the back to signify we're in Triple M's high school band. Chikatilo on the sleeve. Sleeve patches saying wrestling, state champ, air band, show All-American. Bojangles and Nimrod reference on the back. Five-year patch on the front and all three eyes open badge of honor. My nickname is Chain Stitched on the front. Goofy and fun like most of our merch. Also have a 60 by 80 inch stadium fleece blanket, jumbo duffel bag, 15 ounce mug, and some new t-shirts. I uh, had a lot of fun trying to work out a lot of new material in Philly last weekend on the stand-up tour. Thanks for uh, making it fun. Even had a guy come dressed up in a full-on banana suit. Wild times. The Symphony of Insanity tour continues in Columbus. Uh, Columbus, Ohio this weekend at the Funny Bone, September 24th and 25th. Two nights only, four shows. Three of them are either sold out or very close to it. Uh, thank you for that. Then I'm at Cobbs in San Francisco, October 8th and 9th. Spokane, October 15th and se- uh, through the 17th. And then Kansas City, Missouri, October 22nd through the 24th. More dates at dancummins.tv. And now, let's get Colty. In terms of structure, today's episode is going to probably feel pretty similar to our previous coverage of the LDS Church and uh, Suck 157, Mormonism, the good, the bad, and the FLDS. There are numerous similarities between the two. Both religious institutions were founded in the United States in the 19th century. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints traces its founding back to 1830 when founder Joseph Smith and others first convened to form a new religion in upstate New York. The Jehovah's Witnesses can trace their founding back to 1872 when founder Charles Taze Russell broke away from Adventism in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Less than 300 miles and just over 40 years separate the births of these two theological organizations, and both now claim millions of followers. In 2020, the membership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had grown to over 16.6 million. That same year, Jehovah's Witnesses reported an active membership of about half that, 8.4 million. Also, both are groups not considered Christian by many other Christians. For example, Smith's Latter-day Saints consider the Book of Mormon as much a part of the word of the Christian God as the Bible, and they continue to honor their top leader as a prophet, seer, and revelator. But the rest of Christianity, outside of a few LDS offshoot denominations, does not seem to agree with that. Jehovah's Witnesses are also not considered Christian by many Christians for a variety of reasons, including a rejection of the Trinity, the belief that there is one God and three persons or three entities, the Son, the Father, the Holy Spirit. And witnesses also don't believe that everyone who gives their lives to Christ will be rewarded with eternal life. Only 144,000 of the faithful will be rewarded with eternal life in heaven. And, a, and they believe that hell is not real, that when you're dead, you're just dead. And God is uh, you know, not allowing Satan and his minion, minions to gnash their teeth on you anymore. You either go to heaven or you're just gone. Uh, And maybe the most important similarity, both the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Jehovah's Witnesses have been accused by many of being a cult. Today, just like how how I compared Mormons' beliefs with cult criteria to see if I agree with, you know, accusers, I will do the same for Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, Spoiler alert, (laughs) the Jehovah's Witnesses are, in my opinion, for sure, a cult. They may not all live on the same doomsday compound, but they definitely operate a lot like a compound cult in so many ways. That is not something I expected to discover when our Patreon spaces are selected this topic. Uh, Also, one final comparison between this episode and the Mormonism suck. Today's episode uh, will be a harsher critique. Why? Mostly for two reasons. Continually false Armageddon predictions and a continued focus on imminent end times is the first one. 
Many former Jehovah's Witnesses have spoken about how their parents discouraged them from applying to college or about how they weren't supported in planning for their futures at all because of the apocalyptic beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses. That's just not something any part of me can condone. It's irresponsible, it's ignorant, and so unnecessary. Uh, the other reason I'm going to be harsh on, you know, J-Dub is due to a few church policies that have intersected to make their organization a haven for sexual predators. Let me briefly explain the Armageddon stuff first. Regarding the witness history of false Armageddon claims, if you claim that you know the nature of God is this or that, I'm going to be skeptical. I'm skeptical of all claims that you can't scientifically prove. And the more sure of your unprovable, you know, uh, beliefs you are, you know, probably the more I'm going to think you're full of shit. However, I won't be able to tell you that I know that you're full of shit with any conviction. Uh, you know, maybe I'll say that, but I won't be able to totally believe the words coming out of my mouth because I can't prove with 100% certainty that you don't know what you're claiming, that what you're claiming is not true. Just like you can't prove your unverifiable faith-based belief is true to me, I cannot prove that it is not true. I can't prove that some guy like Joseph Smith was not told this or that by God. I wasn't there. I can't prove that Muhammad or Jesus or Abraham or whoever did not hear from God and never knew any more about the nature of God than I do. I can believe that, but I cannot prove that. But when you put a very specific date on something like Armageddon, when you tell me exactly what God is going to do on this exact day of this month, of this year, and then you get that wrong, well, now you've made it real, real easy for me to say definitively, well, you're full of shit. You've seriously damaged your credibility, especially when you get that prediction wrong over and over and over again, and it's the main thrust of your religion. That is exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses have done. When you tell believers of a faith based on your interpretation of scripture that the end of the world will happen for sure on this date, and then that date comes and goes, You've opened up the door for people like me to fairly say, uh, if you were wrong about the one and only thing that could be proved right or wrong at such and such time, why should anyone listen to anything else you have to say when it comes to spiritual beliefs? I would strongly argue that they should not listen to you. And for that reason, above all others, I do not respect the spiritual authority of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't believe in any religious institution, but due to these repeated false claims, I am certain the witnesses do not know what the fuck they are talking about. And if that doesn't feel fair, please remember how hard I've gone on doomsday cults in the past for doing the exact same thing. It would be hypocritical to go hard, uh, you know, to not go hard, excuse me, on Jehovah's Witnesses for the same shit. Just know that I can still think that believers are wonderful people as individuals. I've met some Jehovah's Witnesses. They seem like great people. Just like some say that they can separate the sin from the sinner and love the sinner but hate the sin, uh, I will counter and say that I can separate the believer from the belief. I can hate the belief, but I can love the believer. Now, let me summarize reason number two for my harsh critique, uh, that intersection of some church policies that have made the Jehovah's Witnesses a great group for pedophiles, like the fucking best group. Uh, the first policy is an insistence that various criminal matters, like, se like uh, you know, including sexual offenses, should be dealt with in-house. For example, for more than 30 years, Jehovah's Witnesses leaders have instructed elders specifically across the U.S. to keep cases of child sexual abuse secret from law enforcement and members of their own congregations according to court documents and written directives from the religion's global headquarters in New York. The Jehovah's Witnesses parent organization, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, issued this directive in a series of memos that dates back to 1989. According to Watchtower officials, all of the religion's policies, including these or those pertaining to child sexual abuse, are approved by the organization's spiritual leaders, known as the governing body. And the governing body has specifically instructed witnesses to ignore laws pertaining to the mandatory reporting of child abuse, and that is fucking gross. As you'll learn today, or maybe already know, Jehovah's Witnesses have very little respect for the laws of the nations their members reside in. And they teach members that church law trumps national law. Not a fan of that perspective in general. I feel like if you truly want your own nation and you want to live by your own laws, then go fight for some fucking land. Build your own nation or shut the fuck up, right? It's utterly ridiculous. They're allowed to hide behind their religion when they break the laws of the countries their congregations find themselves in. That's not how nations work or shouldn't. Uh, when religious freedom equals child endangerment, I think some of that religious freedom should be flushed down the fucking toilet. Uh, and how does their religious freedom lead to child abuse? Let me introduce the two witness rule. Jehovah's Witnesses congregational judicial policies require the testimony of not one, but at least two material witnesses to establish a perpetrator's serious sin in the absence of confession. The organization considers this policy to be protection against malicious accusations of sexual assault. 
pretty easy to see how problematic this rule is when it comes to sexual abuse. If, as a Jehovah's Witness, someone molests or rape you or rapes you, you are A, not to go to the police, and B, if there is no second witness, the crime didn't happen. It's just your word against your attacker's word, and since that's not enough for a group of elders adhering to church doctrine to convict anyone, that's going to lead to an automatic verdict of not guilty. The overwhelming majority of rape and molestation incidents don't occur, obviously, in front of an audience. So rapists and pedophiles are, I have to believe, almost never punished in most Jehovah's Witness congregations. How incredibly fucked. Uh, I will lay out specific examples of what victims have gone through, how their accusations were completely ignored, and in some cases, how they were criticized uh, for even making accusations later in this episode. So much to get into today, uh, uh, as there is in most episodes. Let's talk about how I'm going to lay it all out. Uh, it's going to be a challenge to sum up the whole culture and history of a large and complex Christian denomination in just a few hours. I certainly won't be able to explain every aspect of witness beliefs, how those beliefs may have changed over time, and the history of how they arrived at those beliefs. I'm going to do my best to share the most comprehensive look into Jehovah's Witnesses I can in one episode. Uh, first up, we're going to look into the demographics of the witnesses. Uh, who's joining? Where do they live? Etc. Then we'll head to the 19th century, look into their history, following the organization's development up to the present day in a time suck timeline. After that, uh, uh, you know, while we're uh, we'll have already touched on a number of their beliefs and already have, you know, a bit so far, actually, we'll look further into their interesting and controversial theology. Next, we will take a little extra time to look into their very strange masturbation beliefs, very complex and convoluted. One of the stranger aspects of Jehovah's Witness beliefs uh, by far is what church doctrine decrees as far as how members are expected to masturbate. Both men and women are expected to begin masturbation the day they turn 16 and to continue masturbating until the day before their marriage. Both sexes given very specific uh, lust release instruments, they're called, to use. Uh, the, men's, the men's instrument, called a SPIB, stands for Spiritual Protection Intercourse Belt. Looks like some kind of medieval torture device. Uh, maybe some kind of extreme BDSM gear. On the backside of this belt is what uh, they refer to as a prostate massager. Looks like a small dildo with a long string attached to the base uh, when you look it up online. On the front of the belt is two small elastic loops with a piece of cloth in between them with another long piece of string attached. It's very complicated uh, looking. To use it, you put it on, the massager goes in your butt, uh, loops in the front wrap around both, uh, you know, under the under the head of the penis and around the base of the balls, like these little loops on both spots. Then you kind of like seesaw, I guess, these strings back and forth, the one in the back, the one in the front. And that way you never have to stroke your penis until orgasm and thus sin. Okay. Unmarried women wear a save sexual abstinence virginity enhancer. Looks like a metal chastity belt with a metal rod coming up off the front attached to what looks like a fucking captain's wheel on a ship. You spin this wheel, a little wooden flicker, you know, stimulates the clitoris by lightly slapping it over and over rhythmically while a small dildo-shaped prosthetic device thrusts in and out of the vagina with upwards pressure placed on the so-called G-spot. Like with a spib, with a save, you can achieve orgasm without ever touching your flesh with your fingers. And that way, I guess, I guess you don't sin. So fucking complicated. Uh, with both devices, you're expected to leave your clothes on, wear them under your clothes, you know, so you're not, you know... Un unmarried and naked, and which is also considered sinful. And the use of these devices is encouraged because they're believed to help expel unclean, lustful devil thoughts from your mind once you've orgasmed. That is all fucking insane. Picture these ridiculous contraptions, spibs and saves in your mind's eye for a moment, and then let go of those images forever because they're not real. I made that shit up. Spibs and saves. <laughs> spibs and saves are nonsense. It's crazy. <laughs> but doesn't it kind of sound like the shit that a cult formed in the 19th century would come up with? I mean, come on. <laughs> the witnesses actually do have some pretty crazy anti-masturbation beliefs. I will go over soon, but it's not, it's not that complicated. They're not walking around with these weird machines under their fucking weird 19th century farm clothes. I wish, kind of. Uh, for real now, after looking into their interesting and controversial theology, next we'll put them to the cult, cult, cult test. See how they match up or don't with cult criteria used to differentiate a cult and a religion. Then and finally, we'll look at some whistleblowers and some lawsuits. We'll humanize this story by going over some abuse and cover-up examples shared by former members, very brave former members. All right, let's break all this down now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Who are Jehovah's Witnesses today? Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses make up just under 1% of the adult population of the U.S. and make up less than 1% of the population of the world. They count members in every nation in the world. Uh, let's first talk about the U.S. with information from the Pew Research Center's 2016 Religious Landscape Study. 
as of two, 2016, and numbers don't seem to have fluctuated a ton since that, uh, based on articles that have pointed to membership growth, uh, currently approximately 1.3 million witnesses live in the U.S., and they're a very racially and ethnically diverse religious group. Uh, no more than four in 10 members of this group belong to any one racial and or ethnic background. 36% are white, 32% are Hispanic, 27% are black, and 6% are another race or a mixed race. Uh, the majority of Jehovah's Witnesses in the U.S. are 30 to 49 years old, 34%, followed by 50 to 64 years old, who make up 29% of membership. Interestingly, 48% of Jehovah's Witnesses have a household income of less than $30,000 annually. Right around the poverty line for a family of five uh, in 2016, which was 28,643. The median household income for the U.S. that year, 57,617, almost twice 30,000. So a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses down towards the bottom of the household income ladder, which does not surprise me at all after looking into their apocalyptic beliefs. I mean, why put a lot of effort into building up your career, making more money, you know, building up that savings account when you think the world is truly going to end just any day now? Most Jehovah's Witnesses, roughly two-thirds, 65% are women, while only 35% are men. Christians worldwide uh, more likely to be women than men, but this gender gap is particularly large uh, in the context of U.S. Christian groups. Uh, for context, 54% of U.S. Catholics are women. So why is this the case? Why are so many Jehovah's Witnesses women? Honestly, I cannot figure it out. No one who shows up, uh, or no reason that shows up easily in a Google search, um, you know, seems to seems to pop up. Uh, compared with other U.S. religious groups, Jehovah's Witnesses tend to be less educated. Also not surprised. Hard to work up the motivation to pursue a doctorate if you think there's a good chance an angry and insane God is just going to smite the shit out of your campus, classmates, any potential employers you might have before you graduate. A uh, solid majority of adult Jehovah's Witnesses, 63%, have no more than a high school diploma compared with 43% of evangelical Protestants and 37% of non-evangelical Protestants. Jehovah's Witnesses also have a very high, I'm going to bounce on the fuck out of here rate. Uh, still not surprised. Bound to lose a fair amount of constituents when you uh, won't ever stop yapping about the apocalypse and it just keeps on not happening. They don't retain members very well. Among all U.S. adults surveyed who were raised as Jehovah's Witnesses, two-thirds have left the group. Not a good retention rate. Only 34% sticking around once mom and dad can't essentially legally force them to keep going to church. By contrast, about two-thirds of those who are raised as evangelical Protestants 65% uh, and Mormon 64% still say they are members of those respective groups. So how has this religion continued to grow with this kind of shitty retention rate? A lot of door knocking, very heavy focus on door to door salesmanship, literally, literally door to door. If you can't hold on to people, you need to really get aggressive when it comes to recruiting new people all the time. They keep their numbers up with constant evangelizing about two thirds, 65% of current adult Jehovah's witnesses are converts. Another reason they might have a hard time uh, keeping members is due to how militant they are about commitment. Cult, cult, cult. Uh, by traditional measure, measures of religious commitment, Jehovah's Witnesses are one of the most highly religious uh, U.S. groups. Nine in 10 Jehovah's Witnesses say religion is very important in their lives and that they believe in God with absolute certainty. 94% of witnesses believe that the Bible is absolute, indisputable word of God. Uh, the same Pew survey found at least two other interesting ways in which Jehovah's Witnesses stand out in their beliefs. And love Pew, by the way. Bad Magic Productions has donated to them in the past. Holy shit, do they pull off quality studies. And they display their stats in such a clear and intuitive way. They have helped me gather good info for numerous suck topics that I was not able to find anywhere else. So hail Nimrod and hail the Pew Foundation. Uh, back to that research now. While half of Jehovah's Witnesses say they believe in heaven, very few, 7% only, say they believe in hell the traditional image of which is, you know, greatly challenged by the denomination's teaching. Interesting, right? Another example of witnesses differing so significantly in their interpretation of scripture that it's led to a lot of other Christian denominations thinking they're not even Christian. Uh, the overall share of all U.S. Christians who believe in hell is 10 times larger than the witnesses. It's 70%. Another thing that sets uh, most Jehovah's Witnesses apart from many other Christians is the certainty they feel in their beliefs being the undisputed truth. 83% of witnesses say their religion is the one and only true faith uh, leading to eternal life, while only 29% of Christians believe this about their own faith. Compared with U.S. Christians overall, witnesses are especially likely to say they attend religious services at least once a week, 85%. Compared with 47% of U.S. Christians, uh, pray daily, 90% of witnesses versus 68% of other Christians, and perhaps not surprisingly, share their faith with others at least once a week, 76%. 
76% of them claim to be sharing their faith with uh, you know, non-witnesses at least once a week uh, versus 26% of other Christians. Well, you can find a lot of people who identify as Christian uh, who don't attend church services and are frankly, uh, you know, probably don't kind of uh, ignorant about their faith, unable to cite much of any scripture. The same cannot be said for the overwhelming majority of witnesses. You don't fuck around if you're a witness. You are in, you're out. And if you're in, you're almost certainly in deep. Cult, cult, cult. Uh, far more likely than U.S. Christians overall to participate in prayer or scripture study groups and to read scripture at least weekly among other religious behaviors. Uh, also, 100% more likely to wear a spib or a save, as I discussed earlier. Gosh dang. I know. Uh, like many other highly religious Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses tend to take conservative positions on social issues. For example, three quarters, 75% say abortion should be illegal in either all or most all cases. I honestly expect that number to be higher. Uh, 76% oppose same-sex marriage, say homosexuality should be discouraged by society. Again, I'm surprised that number is not higher. Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, their views on human sexuality and its possible sinfulness are uh, pretty ludicrous, pretty hardcore. We'll go over more of those beliefs in a bit. Um, but I do want to share this little gem with you right now. In 2018, two videos that are thought to have been made in 2017, uh, these videos were leaked to the public. These videos were produced by church leaders with the intention of instructing elite Bethel members in regards to their proper sexual conduct and practices, what Jehovah expected of them. The leaked into these videos was dubbed Pillowgate for reasons that will soon be made abundantly clear. Uh, Bethel is the name witnesses use to refer to 87 different branch offices worldwide. Branch offices uh, operate under the oversight of the governing body representatives who visit assigned branches every few years. Branch offices are operated by witness volunteers known as Bethel families who produce and distribute witness literature and communicate with various congregations in their jurisdictions. They're basically the cream of the witness crop, the elites, and thus they are expected to set a good and godly example for their fellow believers. Witness leader Gary Bro, overseer for the governing body service committee, narrates the video intended for the Bethel men. And then governing body helper Ralph Ralph Walls, that's what he's called, a helper, seems like a weird title, narrates the video intended for Bethel women. Gary and Ralph state early on that these videos are intended to show Bethel men and women the proper example they must set for the rest of the witnesses. In this first clip, uh, Brother Ralph, he's telling women to keep their lady skin covered up and hidden to prevent a wave of horniness from crashing into the body of male witnesses and riptiding them back out into a sea of sin. Or, you know, something along those, along those lines. Here we go. Men are generally more easily aroused. The August 1st, 1969 Watchtower said, Christian women have the obligation not to dress provocatively, mm -hmm. not to tempt men to keep looking at them, and so reap a prideful pleasure in noting how they're able to play upon the emotions of men. Mm -hmm. So using your power of reason, yeah. you must realize that Satan's system molds the fashion industry oh boy. so that the clothing worn by women will excite men. What? Satan did that? Please, be mindful of the need to be modest in what you wear at all times. At all times. Wake up, shrub sluts! Climb out of your devil bushes. Unplug your harlot ears. Obviously, Satan himself has total control over any and all clothing production that's even a tiny bit fashionable. Loose-fitting old lady blouses with shoulder pads, long sleeves, enough buttons to never allow for some demon wind to blow apart an inch or so of fabric and reveal the pad of an old J.C. Penny menopause bra? Well, God made that blouse. Avi. Camel toe yoga pants? Devil! Nut spreading spandex bicycle shorts? Satan! Little house on the prairie school marm dress, complete with a bonnet covering a spider web of bobby pins that suggest that the maiden's hair never ever whips about in the throes of orgasm. Jesus wove that himself. Actual knee skin revealing Catholic schoolgirl outfit, 100% Lucifer. Wool turtleneck sweater, that's coin toss. Depends on how tight it is and how big the boobs are. Satan tries to trick big titted witnesses into thinking they can wear the same godly clothes as some of their sisters built more like Popeye's olive oil. But if the sweater's too tight, with God, it ain't right. Pretty sure that phrase was published in the Watchtower, but not certain. I might've made it up. God hates titties. I know that for certain. And he really hates masturbation. Tell him, tell him, Commander Ralph. Come on, keep this positive sexual train moving along the tracks. The next area of concern is a more sensitive matter. Uh-huh. That is to resist the unclean habit of self-abuse or masturbation. Ugh. 
This involves the deliberate stimulation of the genital organs. Oh, my God. Don't let yourself become contaminated by this <laughs> unclean habit. That's right, Commander Ralph. Keep your fingers away from those filth pusses, ladies. Hands off your sin holes. Don't contaminate yourself. Don't even think about sneaking a finger or two in your loophole. Masturbation is an unclean habit. Jesus hates it when your pussy feels good. Jesus has always hated puss, and he always will. God, he fucking hates it so much. For real, though, you are supposed to be careful about sticking anything in your poop hole loophole. Don't stick it in there and then stick it in your vagina. Porn does not often demonstrate healthy sexual habits. Wash it up after loophole insertion, or you could get a bad case of bacterial vaginosis or urinary tract infection. Lucifina wanted me to pass that along. Now back to one of the world's worst TED Talks, where Commander Ralph wants to make sure that witness women know that sex is basically almost always terrible. It reads, flee from sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. Every other sin that a man or a woman may commit is outside his body. Okay. But whoever practices sexual immorality mm -hmm. is sinning against his own body. Oh. In recent years, we have been helped by the faithful and discreet slave to have a clear understanding mm -hmm. of what is involved in the Bible's use of the word pornea or fornication. Gross. It relates to sexual relations involving persons not married to each other. What? And includes acts such as oral sex, yeah. anal sex, yeah. and manipulating or fondling another person's genitals. What? Hand jobs? Yikes. Careful you don't diddle yourself or fondle, fondle someone else's genitals straight into hell, ladies. Keep any and all dicks out of your mouths and loopholes. That, that goes for husbands, right? That's still a sin. Mm-hmm. How dare you actually enjoy sex with your married partner? Just lay down missionary style, stare solemnly, solemnly, without smiling, into each other's eyes, think about the end times, think about Armageddon, pump, you know, just coldly back and forth and hope it's all over soon. Starting to understand why there is not a high percentage of male witnesses now with no blowjob talk. Uh, now let's move on over to witness leader, uh, Commander Gary, overseer for the governing body's service committee. Homosexuality is not accepted on any level within the Jehovah's Witnesses. And here, Commander Gerber warns straight, hetero, God-fearing witnesses that the devil is constantly trying to gay you up. You have to be so careful regarding what kind of clothing you wear, gentlemen. One of Satan's many tricks to pull you from a righteous path is to make you wear tight pants, right? Wearing pants that are a little too tight helps normalize Satan's homosexual agenda. <laughs> It, I, I know it sounds confusing. Commander under his eye, Gare Bear, can explain all of this so much better than I can with his logic, genius logic. To begin, let's see three ways in which Jehovah's Word helps you to keep your personal habits clean. Okay. <laughs> the first way you can do this is by avoiding tight-fitting clothes mm -hmm. that can identify you with homosexuality. <laughs> yep. What kind of clothes are we talking about? Tight clothes. Some outfits are designed to feminize a man's appearance, Ugh. as homosexuals try to do, especially displaying the buttocks huh? and genitals. Oh, no. Why? Because it makes it harder to tell the difference between a homosexual and a heterosexual man, mm -hmm. making homosexuals blend in. I think Robin Thicke sang about that. So these clothes contribute to changing people's opinion of homosexuality. Because they come to see it as normal <laughs> and acceptable. Okay, all right. We know that you never intentionally promote that no. practice. No, <laughs> no. But the question is, how would Jehovah view a man that serves him while dressed in a way that <gasps> identifies him with homosexuality? Oh, great point, Commander Gary Bear. Way to go, Bobby! You just brought Satan into our summer camp by wearing last year's swim trunks. Now we're all scared. Look at how tight and feminine they are. God, we can all see your devil nuts. We can see your Beelzebub bulge. They're too tight on your buttocks, Bobby. Now we're all gay. <laughs> now we all can't stop thinking about your tight shorts. And now, my, now our shorts are tight in the front at least. Tight clothing doesn't just help Satan normalize homosexuality, you guys. According to Commander Gare Bear, it can also lead, please sit down for this. It can lead to, directly to the powerful and terrifying sin of self-abuse. Sit, sit down and just hold your crosses tight. Wait, listen to this next part. A second way you need to keep on guard is mm -hmm. resisting the unclean habit of masturbation. Hear, hear. 
The God's Love Book explains that <laughs> masturbation is the stroking or rubbing of the genital organs, <laughs> okay. commonly resulting in an orgasm. Yeah, that's how it works. So does a person have to use their hands to masturbate? Oh, they can use a spib or a safe. For example, hmm. say a brother wears an undergarment that's so tight it rubs his <laughs> penis uh -huh. as he moves around. More tight pants talk. He gets aroused and even ejaculate. Oh, no! Is he masturbating? Mm. Yes, he is. Oh, he is. Because he's deliberately stimulating his genitals, even though he's not using his hands. Oh, nice try, Steve. Sure, you're not technically beating off. You're not stroking or rubbing your genital organs, but you are wearing your fifth grade brother's pants as a 23-year-old. We see what you're trying to pull there, bud. Your pud. Now you're done. No heaven for you. Okay, last clip from this video. <laughs> this, is the, this is the clip that led to the term pillowgate. Check out a bit more of Commander Gare Bear's, you know, cringeworthy uh, wisdom. Does there have to be an orgasm for it to be considered masturbation? Mm, I, th I think so. Suppose a brother starts rubbing his genitals against a pillow. He oh. gets an erection, yeah. but stops before having an orgasm. So it's not then, right? Is he masturbating? No, he's not. Yes. Oh! Again, Fuck. because he's deliberately stimulating himself. Okay. Whether he has an orgasm or not. Okay. How about having an emission of semen at night? Mm. Maybe even after an erotic dream. Mm, Is no. Is that masturbation? No, I don't think so. No. Ha! <laughs> Jehovah made that a part of a man's reproductive system, yeah. and it happens without any deliberate stimulation. Mm -hmm. But even so, what? when this happens to you, yeah. it would be good to examine whether you were dwelling on sexual thoughts before going to sleep. Ooh, great thought, Commander Gare Bear. Could you have been sleeping in a position that stimulated you? Probably. Such as with a blanket or pillow held tightly between your legs? Oh. If you're honest with yourself about these matters, it will help you to avoid <sighs> falling into unclean practices. Unclean practices that lead you to the devil. Oh, Steve, you know what you did, you dirty fucking pillow humper. Come on, brother. Like God's gonna fall for the oldest jerk off trick in the book. The one where you feel so guilty about sex that you won't dare touch your penis ever because you're afraid of being smited by an angry God and then so much cum builds up inside you that your subconscious eventually takes over when you're asleep and dreams up some fun that you never have in real life, and then you empty the chamber out in your pillow. <laughs> that's the old, old jerk-off trick, where you, where you wake up fear and damnation for an ejaculation you literally have no fucking memory of. Nice, nice try, Steve, you hedonistic devil perv. Clearly, Jehovah's Witnesses' views on hu human sexuality are fucking insane. <laughs> They're puritanical, draconian, homophobic, absurd. Completely out of touch with biological reality. And they're just idiotic. If you believe any of this, why? Why would you want to keep worshiping such a douchebag of a God? Why would you want to belong to a group who clearly thinks that God is some kind of sex-hating weirdo? Brother Garebear and Ralph can both get fucked. What a couple of fear and anxiety-inducing destructive tools they are. I hope another video is leaked of these two clowns involved in some kind of hardcore sex fetish, right? Exposing them both as hypocrites. Maybe a, maybe a video of Garebear, like having a dominatrix just box his balls. <laughs> and Brother Ralph. Is, uh, tied up beside him in like a gimp mask, getting roughly pegged by the same dominatrix. Grab the spreader bar and arm biters, brother Care Bear. <laughs> Tie brother Ralph up. Take the gag ball out of your mouth. Choke on the cock of Incubus. Prepare for sexual ascension. I don't know. One, one can dream. Uh, moving along into some more stats now before looking at the history of the witnesses. Roughly three quarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, 74%, also reject evolution saying humans have always existed in their present form since the very beginning of time. So wheat, these guys just keep seeming more and more awesome and super intelligent. Uh, guessing there are not a lot of successful Jehovah's Witnesses archaeologists. Luckily, Jehovah's Witnesses do not commonly advocate for these beliefs in the political sphere. That's another belief we'll get into soon that members are taught to remain politically neutral and abstain from voting or participating in any action to change governments. And that's reflected in their numbers too. Three quarters of witnesses, 75% say they are political independents who do not lean toward either major party, half declined to answer or half declined to answer a question about political ideology. Uh, and most Jehovah's Witnesses, 64%, when asked if they were registered to vote, said that they were not registered or just declined to answer that question. Let's now dig deeper into where the Jehovah's Witnesses are, at least in the US. 
state of Wyoming has the highest percentage of witnesses, 3% of the population of Wyoming witnesses. Uh, Washington, this is this episode, probably, probably not going to download great there. <laughs> uh, Washington, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Georgia, all have witnesses uh, as 2% of their entire state population. I didn't think it would be that. Man, Georgia has a lot because they have a fairly big in Washington. Hmm. Uh, the remaining states have populations of Jehovah's Witnesses of 1% or less. New York, the state in which the church is headquartered, has a population of right around 1%. You know, less than, less than 1% of Idaho attends Kingdom Hall services. I thought there'd be more around here, actually. Like we said, worldwide Jehovah's Witnesses report they have 8.4 million people actively involved in preaching as of 2020. Hard to get exact figures uh, for the witnesses, truly, because to be counted as an active member, an individual must uh, be something called a publisher, which means they report regular time spent preaching to non-members, normally at least an hour per month, quite often a lot more than that. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses official stats only count members uh, who submit reports for preaching activity, which would result in, you know, lower m membership numbers than, you know, membership numbers found by like an external survey. Uh, kind of backwards if you think about it. You'd think they'd want to inflate their membership numbers, but that's not how they operate. Uh, under certain circumstances, such as chronic and debilitating illness, members may report preaching increments of only 15 minutes, right? You only have to do 15 minutes if you're very, very sick. You know, maybe when your doctor comes to check on your vitals, you know, you, you just try to convert them or something. All right, Tyrone, your blood pressure is stabilized. Uh, your vitals look good. You should be ready to head home tomorrow. Uh, that's great, Dr. Richards. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Do you believe in the kingdom of God and that soon, since we are in the last days, God's laws will be replaced the corrupted and satanic laws of, of man? Uh, I got a lot of other patients to attend to, Tyrone. If you have any medical questions, please tell your nurse to come find me. Wait, wait before you go, Dr. Richards, I, uh, I need a new pillow. This one's, it's too, uh, it's too comfortable. <laughs> Last night, this Jezebel pillow, well, it led me into sin. Uh, so how are, are these witness preaching hours being tracked? Jehovah's Witnesses preaching activity is uh, self-reported. Members directed to submit a field service report every month. <laughs> Baptized members who fail to submit a report every month are termed irregular. Don't want to be an irregular witness. Those who do not submit a report for six continuous months, well, you're inactive. You're not even really a witness. For 2020, about 1.7 billion hours of preaching were reported. Nearly 242,000 new members were baptized, uh, which was actually a net decrease of about 47,000 from the year before. More than 7.7 7, uh, million home Bible studies with Jehovah's Witnesses were reported, including Bible studies conducted by witness parents with their children. According to official statistics, about 17.8 million people worldwide attend Jehovah's Witnesses or attended Jehovah's Witnesses 2020 observance of the memorial of Christ's death and annual celebration of theirs, almost twice their official membership numbers. So maybe there are more witnesses than the church is declaring. Enough current stats now. How did this group come to be? Let's look into their history. Time for today's Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline. Eighteen sixty nine, Jehovah's Witnesses originated as a branch of the uh, Bible student movement, which developed in the U.S. in the eighteen seventies, amongst followers of Christian minister Pastor Russell, aka Charles Taze Russell, old Taze dog, old Taze and confused. In eighteen sixty nine, young seventeen year old Russell, son of Scotch Irish immigrants, lived in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, a community later annexed by Pittsburgh in nineteen o seven. At that time, it was just Cross River, uh, where he was born and raised, and where he worked in his father's haberdashery shop. Why don't, why don't we have a bunch of haberdashery shops anymore? He was selling fabric to townsfolk to be used in making dresses, suits, and other articles of clothing. He watched a presentation by Adventist, Adventist Christian preacher Jonas Wendell and soon after began attending an Adventist Bible study group in his hometown of Allegheny, led by George Stetson. Uh, he was a very strange and spiritually curious man from a very young age. When he was a kid, he, Russell was known to chalk Bible verses on fence boards and city sidewalks. In an attempt to convert unbelievers, he particularly uh, noted the punishment of hell awaiting the unfaithful in his little chalkings. Early fixation on doom and gloom and God's wrath. He sounds super fun. Not worrisome at all. I'm sure all of you parents listening would love to have a kid writing warnings of the apocalypse on the sidewalk. Uh, in 1865, Russell uh, left the too spiritually laid back Presbyterian church. Uh, when he was 13, he joined a local, much more puritanical, God is always angry congressional church. In 1868, when he was 16, he considered leaving Christianity altogether. He didn't feel like the local pastors were correctly interpreting the Bible. Not strict enough. Maybe allowing too much pillow fuckery. 
too much hedonistic and homosexual wearing of tight-ass devil slacks and the like. Uh, and then when he heard Jonas Wendell preach in 1869, he was, uh, you know, 17. Although he did not entirely agree with Wendell's arguments, the man's presentation inspired him with renewed zeal and belief in the Bible uh, that it was the word of God. And guess what Wendell's Adventist focus was on? The second coming of Christ, a.k.a. the second advent of Christ. And the second coming leads to what? Armageddon. When the armies of heaven will eradicate all who oppose the kingdom of God, wiping out all wicked, tight pants wearing meat sacks on earth, only leaving loose clothing, righteous mankind behind. Nice! Fuck yeah, bro! Burn them! Burn them all! Uh, Adventists, including Seventh-day Adventists, uh, also believe that Christ's return is, quote, imminent, about to happen any day now. And when Russell saw Wendell preach in 1869, he, uh, he, was, he saw him putting a date on God cleansing the earth. He said that Christ would return in either 1873 or 1874. And if he would have seen Wendell preach in 1867, he would have heard Wendell say that the world was definitely going to end in 1868. This is fucking perfect. The founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, spiritually inspired by a doomsday preacher who was constantly fucking up doomsday predictions. In 1870, tased and confused Russell and his dad and some uh, other wackadoodles formed their own non-denominational Bible study group. And by thoroughly studying the Bible over the next several years, they come to the conclusion, like many cult leaders, that everyone else is doing it very wrong. They figure out that the Trinity, hellfire, the inherent immortality of the soul, not substantiated by scripture. Uh, weird that Russell's adherents over a century later will not believe in the Trinity because that is not based in scripture, but will believe that tight pants are part of the devil's plan to turn us all gay. Uh, very interesting. Almost, as, uh, almost like totally crazy or something. In early January 1876, Russell meets with independent Adventist preachers Nelson H. Barber and John H. Patton, publishers of the Herald of the Morning. And these highly logical, shrewd biblical scholars convinced Russell that Christ had already returned to earth in 1874 when he was invisible. You may now be wondering why the fuck would they think this? Well, these two clowns, Barber and Patton, they've been doing a bunch of fuzzy biblical math for years. and They thought they'd come up with some definitive timetable regarding Christ's return. They pulled numbers out of various verses and out of their asses, probably mostly out of their asses, and they carried the ones and they rounded up and they'd been preaching that Christ was going to come back to earth for sure in 1873. And then, you know, he, uh, he didn't. So they went back and they checked their math again, uh, made sure they didn't miss any numbers, mistake, uh, any threes for eights, stuff like that. And then they realized they were almost right. Only off by one Christ was returning in 1874 <laughs> for sure. And then, you know, he didn't. And Barbara and Peyton, I imagine, felt pretty fucking stupid. At least they should have. They went back to the drawing board again, and then they determined that they were totally right the whole time. Christ did return in 1874. Bingo, bango. But no one saw him because he was invisible. Obvi, the answer was right there the whole time. No one saw him because magic. I shit you not. This is how they rationalized fucking up their prediction. Uh, continue with his second coming math and predictions. Barbara now, Peyton seems to have taken a background role. Uh, he preaches that God's spiritual harvest is to run from 1874 to the spring of 1878, concluding with the translation of the living saints into the air. He says 1881 will mark the restoration of the Jews in Palestine. Uh, the period from 1881 to 1914 will see the installation of God's kingdom on earth. Uh, he says, for sure, Armageddon will wrap up uh, by 1914 uh, at the latest, and then only the righteous will still walk the earth. So print it. Done gonna happen. And then they did print it. And then, you know, they look like idiots later. Uh, 1877 now, 25 year old Jehovah's Witness founder, Charles Taze to confuse Russell thinks all of this makes perfect sense because he is also crazy. And he provides financial backing for Barbara and becomes co-editor of Herald of the Morning. The pair jointly issue three worlds in the harvest of this world. This big uh, publishing in 1877, written mostly by Barber. Various concepts in this book still taught in the Bible student movement today and in Jehovah's Witnesses including a 2,520-year period termed the Gentile Times that was originally predicted to end in 1914. Uh, these guys' vision of Armageddon departed from Adventist teachings by advancing Russell's concept of restitution, that all humankind since Adam would be resurrected to the earth and given the opportunity for eternal, perfect human life. They've given the, given the opportunity to become one of the 144,000. Uh, their book also taught the earth or taught that the earth would not be burned up when Christ returned, which I guess some people were teaching at that time. And it revealed that all of the saints will be taken to heaven in April of 1878, which for sure happened. Do you remember that? Do you remember uh, reading about how back in a April of 1878, like all these people just went, just went, whoop, just like up into heaven, all the best people, you know, 
Uh, me neither. I don't remember reading about any of that shit. Uh, Russell continued to develop his interpretations of biblical chronology in 1877. Also that year, he publishes 50,000 copies of the pamphlet, The Object and Manner of Our Lord's Return, teaching that Christ will return again, invisibly, <laughs> before the Battle of Armageddon. So smart to go with the invisible Jesus. It's so much easier to predict the return of invisible Jesus than it is uh, to predict when visible Jesus will show up, right? Mysterious ways. Mysterious Needlessly confusing, convoluted ways. Amen. Uh, by 1878, Russell is teaching the Adventist view that the time of the end had begun in 1799, that Christ had returned inv invisibly. Oh, that fucking kills me. In 1874, and then he uh, had been crowned in heaven as king, like literally crowned as king in heaven in 1878. Uh, excuse me? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What, what was that last part? Uh, crowned king in heaven? What? What the fuck is happening here? They have medieval coronation, excuse me, ceremonies in heaven now. There's a throne up there. Maybe, maybe a royal court. Do they have a jester up there? God, please tell me they have a jester. Some guy up on a cloud telling corny Bible jokes. <laughs> Just, uh, hey, uh, uh, why, why couldn't the Israelites uh, initially enter the promised land? Because it wasn't the pinky promised land. Oh! <laughs> what did the little boy say when uh, asked why he kept walking by the same little girl at school? I was told I'm supposed to walk by faith. Oh, oh, oh! Why didn't anyone want to fight Goliath? Because he seemed like a giant pain in the tuckus. Oh, I'll be here all week. And by week, I mean headlining for eternity. <laughs> Fucking love that slide was fun. Uh, ridiculous. Before 1878, there was concern, I guess, in heaven that Christ maybe wouldn't be crowned king. Who else was going to be crowned? Right? Does, does Jesus have like a like an older half-brother we don't know about that made some claim for the throne, fucking uh, Jerry Christ. You know, it is I, Jerry Christ. Heaven's throne shall be mine. Free turkey legs for everyone if Jerry Christ becomes heaven king. And how about some lower cut blouses for our heavenly tavern wenches? About time we see some of those celestial tatas. And then some royal attendants like, Jerry, this is heaven. Free turkey legs, that's not a big deal of here. And the hot tata stuff, it's, that's not God's vibe. You're not doing yourself any favors right now. Uh, witnesses do, <laughs> they do believe there is some kind of actual structured government up in heaven with a king. <laughs> that Jesus is some kind of medieval king and then he was crowned king. Now they believe in 1914. They used to believe in Tay's dog's time that he was crowned in 1878. They love, as you'll see, to change numbers around to suit the times they're in. Uh, witnesses believing uh, you know, that Christ and God are different entities and that Christ is actually an inferior to God and is his firstborn son, um, this is an also belief, you know, maybe he'll have more sons. Uh, you know, one of the many scriptural departures that leads a lot of other believers to think that, you know, witnesses aren't really Christian. Okay, 1879 now. Russell and Barber have broken up. They just can't agree on Armageddon. You know, or, or maybe for other reasons too. Like maybe maybe Barber was wearing some, you know, vests that were a little too tight, a little too revealing. Maybe, you know, was trying to send the devil into Russell's underoos or something. Not sure, trying to turn him into homosexual. Uh, Russell and Barber are bummed. Their prediction of a rapture in 1878 did not come to be. The rapture is part of the end times events. It's when all Christian uh, believers who are alive, along with resurrected believers, will do some version of rising up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Some cartoony stuff that made sense when people wrote it down around 2,000 years ago, but makes less sense now. Uh, Taze Dog and Barber start bickering over some frankly kind of boring minor points of theology about exactly who Jesus is and how his sacrifice led to the possibility of heaven, this issue known as Christ's ransom, and yada, yada, yada. July of 1879, Russell stops publishing with Barber, you know, right? Because they can't agree. Now he's doing his own thing. It's, it's real similar. Their breakup is kind of similar to like Simon and Garfunkel, right? Sure, they were good together. But now Russell is going to write more hits on his own and Barber is going to fade into relative obscurity, but still have pretty cool hair. Uh, Russell begins publishing his own monthly magazine, Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Mm, sounds like a slow, tough read. This will eventually be renamed the Watchtower announcing Jehovah's Kingdom the most important publication of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Readers of Zion's Watchtower quickly formed 30 Bible study groups in seven states in the U.S. from 1879 to 1880, with each congregation electing their own leaders, uh, elders, excuse me. The Witnesses are forming, pulling largely from the Adventist faithful who are, you know, used to obsessing over the second coming. More and more people are choosing to really focus on impending doom, not be half-assed about it. On, they're focusing on God coming down here and soon to wash the world clean of filthy sinners. Uh, what a bitter, hateful focus, by the way. 
How, how do those who have such hard-ons for the rapture not see that? How do they not see that their primary motivation for Armageddon is not God's love? It's not being held in God's loving embrace. It's hate. So much hate. It's punishment. It's self-righteous vengeance. It's a very hateful group. Fuck these sinners. I can't fucking wait for God to make them pay. And pay for what? For fucking who they want to fuck, uh, how they want to fuck, for enjoying a strong drink, for watching Netflix, for wearing some tight-ass pants, for not going to sad and insane Bible study sessions all the time instead of doing something enjoyable with their lives. Uh, I get the feelings of vengeance in general. I feel that, you know, shit too. How many times have I talked about wanting this or that motherfucker to be killed? I'm very pro-murder in the right circumstances. I just don't get hiding behind a supposedly loving God when it comes to those feelings, right? Own them. I do. I don't always pretend they're noble. Uh, and with doomsday believers, if you believe that all sinners, you know, that you hate are going to burn in hell uh, when they're dead anyway, or at least just be dead like the witnesses believe, and you get to go to heaven, you know, when you die, then then what's the, what's the hurry? You're going to get everything you want, you know, once we're all dead. So just wait. Enjoy your time here. Sleep tight. Thinking about how God's going to burn the wicked or, you know, punish them or, you know, whatever, at least not reward them when you're, when, you know, we're all gone. Why does the world always have to end? It's just such a ridiculous belief system that is just horrific. There's nothing, there's literally nothing good about it. And it's all too common. In, in these new uh, Zion's Watchtower centric Bible study groups, elders and deacons are now being elected by their congregations. Uh, a true denominational structure starting to come together. Russell opposes formal, formal disciplinary procedures by congregation elders claiming this is uh, beyond their authority, instead recommending that an individual who continues in a wrong course should be judged by the entire congregation uh, and then they could, could ultimately just withdraw from him his fellowship or her fellowship if the undesirable behavior continues. A later, a different form of this policy will come into play with all the child abuse allegations. In 1880, Russell visits his new congregations to conduct six-hour study sessions, teaching each local, con local congregation how to carry out a topical biblical study correctly in 1881, the Zion's Watch Tower Tract Society is formed as an unincorporated administrative agency in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for the purpose of disseminating tracts, papers, doctrinal treaties, and Bibles. So now, as of 1881, they're officially formed as basically a religious nonprofit. And off they go, and they grow and grow. Russell, of course, leads them annually, uh, re-elected as president, referred to as Pastor Russell. They have a president, a board of directors, uh, essentially known as the governing body, almost all always dudes, I think except for one, I think except for Russell's wife, they've always been dudes. Uh, and the president uh, definitely always been a dude. Charles will be president from 1884 all the way to 1916. His organization will actually never be called Jehovah's Witnesses during his lifetime. They'll be called Bible students. The Watchtower Society opens uh, overseas branches in London in 1900, Germany in 1903, Australia and Switzerland in 1904. The society's headquarters is transferred to Brooklyn, New York in 1909. And they go on to eventually, you know, fill up every country in the world. Uh, also important to note, these Bible student branches are not churches. They are regional headquarters where Bible student literature is being produced by volunteers for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. The Witnesses have an interesting and honestly a little bit confusing structure. None of the people who work for Jehovah's Witnesses get paid, at least not directly. The governing body members in certain positions are given food, lodging, health care, except for blood transfusions, uh, travel expenses are paid, uh, you know, for like preaching, they're provided clothes, not too tight, place to live, uh, all that they need, but they have no money of their own to freely spend on like, you know, women or booze or anything fun. Or at least they're not uh, supposed to have that money. It, it reminds me a lot of Catholic nuns and priests, except, except actually they do actually uh, earn a modest salary in modern times. Uh, also interesting, there's no tithing. Uh, witnesses are not expected to give, you know, like 10% of their money to the church, uh, but they are encouraged to donate and to donate everything they can spare. Uh, all of the organization's money comes from donations and they have done very well in this system. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society listed the book value of its assets on its 2015 IRS Form 990T as $1,451,217,000. So roughly a billion and a half dollars. In 2016, in just Canada alone, they received roughly $80 million in donations. In Canada, they're one of like the top 10, uh, you know, nonprofits to, you know, as far as money received basically every year. They're doing very well. Where does all that money go? Uh, a lot of it goes into publishing all their literature. And some think some of it disappears into the pockets of leadership, but uh, I have no proof of that. Also to back up now, back in Russell's day, Russell the love muscle. There were none of the kingdom halls now associated with witnesses. Bible students, they just met in people's homes for the most part at regularly appointed times, you know, a few days a week, but there weren't sermons per se. There were Bible discussions and studies led by local elders. 
Uh, they focused not on building churches, but you know, on you know, kicking out so much literature. So many repent now or lose your immortal soul pamphlets. In 1910, the secular journal Overland Monthly calculated that by 1909, Russell's writings had become the most widely distributed, privately produced English language works in the U.S. It said that the entire body of his works were the third most circulated on earth after the Bible and the Chinese Almanac. In 1912, the Continent, a Presbyterian journal, stated that in North America, Russell's writings had achieved a greater circulation than the combined circulation of the writings of all the priests and preachers in North America. So really getting that apocalyptic word out. A lot of that word was based on Russell's new prediction that the world is now going to end in 1914. All right, he's writing a lot about how the last days, you kind of covered this, you know, they, they began back in 1799. And then, you know, 1874, that's when Invisible Jesus started hanging around on earth. No specifics written about what Invisible Jesus was up to. Hopefully not hanging around in women's dressing rooms, right? Or bathhouses like a naughty Jesus. Don't be naughty Jesus or Jerry Christ will take your heaven crown. <laughs> come on, come on. Anyway, Tay's dog said that 1878 was when Invisible Jesus was crowned king in heaven. You know, when he beat out Jerry. And 1940, 1914 was when the world as we know it would for sure end. That's when sinners are going to be smited. The rapture is going to occur and, you know, blah, blah, hateful, blah. Then 1914 comes and goes and nothing happens. Ah, you, you tricked us, invisible Jesus. And the date is now moved, you know, to 1915. <laughs> and then 1915, you know, comes and goes, nothing happens. So they move it to 1918. Mm -hmm. And in more recent years, you know, they started swapping shit around again and started preaching 1914 was not the end of the end times. It was the beginning of the end times. <laughs> Come on, that's what we meant. Like in 1992, the Watchtower printed that the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly man is drawn near. Uh, it pains me that the idiots running this organization can keep making millions and millions of dollars in donations when their main focus is the end of days and they just prove over and over that they have no clue what they're talking about. Oh, uh, also, did I mention before we move on from Charles Russell that he talked a lot about pyramids? Mm-hmm. Actually, he talked a lot about one pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Russell believed that the Great Pyramid of Giza was built by the Hebrews under God's direction and why was it built by God? To help people living in Charles's day help figure out when Jesus was coming back to cleanse the earth of sinners. God had the Great Pyramid of Giza built so tased and confused would know what to write in his doomsday pamphlets. Seriously, that's what he believed. This guy's fucking insane. Charlie Cuckoo Puffs referred to the Pyramid of Giza as the Bible in stone. He believed that certain biblical texts, including Isaiah 19, 19 through 20, 19, 20, and others prophesied a future understanding of the Great Pyramid and this understanding would unfold the mysteries of the rapture in his time. This lunatic was obsessed with the end times. He was the early 20th and late 19th century version of a maniac wearing a sandwich board full of revelations verses, holding a megaphone and screaming about God's wrath is almost upon us in like Times Square or someplace. Uh, one more thing about Russell the Love Muscle's beliefs. Let's talk about the 144,000. Why is that number so associated with Jehovah's Witnesses? Uh, Book of Revelations, chapter seven, verse four from the King's James Version of the Bible. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 140 and 40, wait, sealed in 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Russell taught, and witnesses still teach, that God selects a limited number of faithful Christians who will, after their deaths, be resurrected to life in heaven. These 144,000 will help Jesus rule uh, a new earth after God wipes the earth, you know, clean in the end times. Fuck yeah. Uh, on their own website right now, under Bible teachings, there's a big header that reads misconceptions about those who go to heaven. Misconception, all good people go to heaven. And then under, underneath that, fact, God promises everlasting life on earth for most good people. Holy shit. Live a, live a scared, terrible life, worry about God's wrath when you have a wet dream and wear tight pants, and then maybe go to heaven, but probably not. <laughs> That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses essentially believe. I mean, on the bright side, they don't believe in hell. They just think you're dead and gone and cease to exist in any way if you're not part of the 144,000 when you die. So that's cool, I guess. Well, let's talk more about their, you know, vision of heaven. Think about the total number of witnesses now, around 8.5 million, but only 144,000 witnesses go to heaven. And that's, and that's 144,000 since the time of Jesus's death in 33 CE until now is what they, is, is what they now preach. It was for a while, you know, with tied to Adam, but now it's tied to Jesus's death. Holy shit. If you only counted today's witnesses and you were a witness, you would have a 1.7 chance of going to heaven, but factor in all the people who've come before you and you basically have the same chance of going to heaven if you're very devout and a witness that you do of hitting a multi-million dollar lottery jackpot like this month. 
how the fuck have they been able to grow this horse shit into a religion of millions? It's, it's terrible salesmanship. Fear, probably fear of God's wrath, you know, that he'll kill you in the rapture, but he, but he's not going to let you be tormented in death. So there's not even that much to be afraid of. I have no idea how they've been able to trick so many people into falling for this shit. I guess, I guess numbers print enough pamphlets and you're bound to catch a few desperate people at the right desperate time and distract them with friends and fellowship. So they don't think too hard about all the crazy theology you're trying to cram into their heads. I got to say, in the vein of comparing them to the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, Mormonism has a way better sales pitch. At least in Mormonism, if you're faithful enough, you get to be a god in the afterlife. That's a, that's a great sales pitch. Uh, let's zip up to 1916 now. When founder Charles, too bad nobody tased him, Russell dies. He dies in Texas at the age of 64 during a cross-country preaching trip. He died doing what he loved. He died what he did best, talking crazy about Armageddon. Uh, he would not leave behind any children. Why have kids, you know, when the world's going to end? Uh, he'd gotten married in 1879, but the couple separated over theological differences, of course, and were granted a divorce in 1906. Now everyone wanted to know who was going to be the next president. Cue Game of Thrones music. On January 6th, is it going to be Jerry Christ? No. Uh, January 6th, 1917, board member, Society Legal Counsel, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, is elected president of the Watchtower Society, unopposed. It's a landslide at a convention in Pittsburgh. At the convention, laws are also passed stating that the president will be the executive officer and general manager of the society, giving Joe Frank full control of its affairs worldwide. Uh, Russell basically already had that, but now it's been formalized. Joe Frank Rutherford gets right down to his own doomsday declarations. He quickly declares that God will destroy churches wholesale, his words, and church members by the millions in now 1918. Fuck yeah! And that all earthly governments will be totally destroyed by 1920. Nice! Resulting in anarchy. This announcement actually prompts many Bible students, still not going by Jehovah's Witnesses yet, to give up their businesses, give up their jobs, sell their homes. Some Bible student farmers in Canada and the U.S. Uh, refused to seed their spring crops in 1925. They mock members of the movement who do. Uh, but some of those members mocked them right back when those idiots didn't have any crops, you know, and the world was still spinning, same as it ever was. In 1923, a Watchtower article predicted, our thought is that 1925 is definitely settled by the scriptures. Their words, definitely. As to Noah, the Christian now has much more upon which to base his faith than Noah had upon which to base his faith in a coming deluge. Uh, but of course, 1925 came and went, and then Watchtower publications make no admission of error over the predictions. Uh, you know, for 1925, the predictions that ruined so many people's lives. But Joe Frank, Joe Frank the Tank, would eventually apologize at some conventions. Yeah, I bet he did. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, Joe Frank here. Little red in the face today. <laughs> Sorry about the whole prediction snafu. I know a lot of you are, you know, uh, you sold uh, everything. Uh, many of you lost it all. And uh, churches are still standing and God hasn't seemed to, you know, uh, smite anyone. Uh, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. We're starting to come to the realization that Revelation slash Pyramid End Times prediction math is pretty hard. So please, just hold tight, keep wearing loose pants and boxy dresses, not having fun sex and never masturbating, and we'll go back to the drawing board to try and figure out when, uh, you know, far less than 1% of you will be called to heaven in the rapture and the rest of you will just be, you know, uh, just will die. Uh, Joe Frank uh, would go to a lot of conventions. Major annual conventions were organized from 1922, 1928, uh, which were publicity events as much as spiritual gatherings. 1924, he expanded his means of spreading the Watchtower message with the start of 15 minute, 15 minute radio broadcasts, initially from WBBR based on Staten Island, eventually via a network of as many as 480 radio stations. So that's sweet. Uh, the new preaching methods brought in an influx of members through the early 1920s. Then attendance at the Bible students' uh, yearly memorial fell sharply again. It dropped from 90,434 in 1925 to 17,380 in 1928. Well, <laughs> yeah, that kinda, that's kind of, that's what happens when you, when you blow up uh, your end times prediction, when you get it wrong. Um, Joe Frank said that, you know, God was just shaking out the unfaithful. That's one way to interpret it. Another way, uh, you know, it could be that more people just started to realize how crazy all this shit was. Uh, 1929, Joe Frank Rutherford announces that the vindication of God's name will ultimately occur when millions of unbelievers will be destroyed at Armageddon, uh, that this is the primary doctrine of Christianity, more important than God's display of goodness or grace towards humans, right? If you didn't understand before that doomsday is all that matters, you, you do now. Cult, cult, cult. 
It's the most important thing. Uh, meanwhile, Joe Frank is living in a 10 bedroom luxury villa called Beth Serum, built in San Diego, California, 1930 to house the biblical princes he preached about expecting to be resurrected before Armageddon. Interesting. Uh, he was known apparently to drink a lot of expensive whiskey in this luxury villa, enjoying his time while he's preaching about doom. Might not be getting a, a paycheck, but spending that donation money pretty lavishly. Rutherford also ousted many of the Watchtower Society directors, anyone who defied him. Cult, cult, cult. Former directors would claim Rutherford had required all headquarters workers to sign a petition supporting him and threatening dismissal for anyone who refused to sign. Uh, more than half of the Bible student movement members now leave over differences in Rutherford's teachings, teachings that had departed from old Taze Dog's earlier doctrine. Now there's trouble in the doomsday cult. Those who stayed under Joe Frank's watch decided to take a new name and the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society renamed themselves dun, 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 Jehovah's Witnesses on July 26, 1931 at a convention in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so now we've arrived at their name, name based on the scripture of Isaiah 4, 4310. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. The Watchtower said the new distinctive name was designed to exalt God's name and end public confusion from many different groups using the Bible Students Movement umbrella. The publication explained it will be a name that can that could not be used by another and such as none other will want to use. Okay. Under Rutherford, the Jehovah's Witnesses grow from about 44,000 in 1928 to about 115,000 when, when he dies on January 8th, 1942. And man, have they grown a lot since then. Uh, the Bible students who chose to not follow Rutherford splinter into various small Jehovah's Witness-esque denominations. Uh, some are still around, but they're all pretty small. Seems like the biggest one is the Don Bible Students Association. In the late 80s, they had around an estimated 60,000 members and thought to have less today. 1931, more Jehovah's Witnesses. Distinct, uh, distinctive beliefs start to emerge. Uh, Armageddon's given a new date again. Smart. Just keep doubling down. I'm looking really stupid. Witnesses now actually are being told to stop conceiving children and stop getting married because now the end of the world is going to happen in 1938. I know earlier, we're, you know, what was it, 1925? Now it's 1938. A lot of 1937 plans put on hold. So much terror, so much fear. As if the Great Depression didn't add enough sadness and chaos to people's lives. By 1935, witnesses are told they should refuse to salute the flag as well. Uh, they should refuse to stand for the national anthem or serve in the military or serve in the government in any position. Because all of that is one of you know it's, uh, Satan's attempts to get you to focus not on God's soon-to-be-here heavenly kingdom, but on the fake-ass, about-to-be-smited kingdoms of man. In late 1936, schools in the U.S. began to expel witness students who refused to salute the flag. Uh, before he died, Rutherford would take some of these cases all the way to the Supreme Court, which returned a verdict in 1940, saying that schools did have the right to expel students who would not salute the flag. Uh, the Supreme Court decision prompted a wave of violence against witnesses in the U.S., mostly in small towns and rural areas where they were beaten, castrated in at least one case, and tarred and feathered in some other cases, and in a few cases killed. Uh, murder and castration seems a bit excessive. For not, for not saluting the flag. Expelling from school, though, I, I do get that. I do understand the argument there, actually. Your nation, a nation many have died defending, is providing you a public school education, and you can't even acknowledge that you respect that nation for a few moments to start your day? Feels pretty ungrateful and shitty to me. I think a lot of people confuse saluting the flag as a sign of respect for all the good America has done with agreeing with literally everything that America has ever done. In my opinion, you don't have to love everything that your politicians and people have done in your country to still love your country. Uh, more than 2,500 cases of violence against witnesses reported from 1940 to 1944 and hundreds of witnesses arrested and charged with crimes. People losing sons, brothers, friends, and husbands to World War II, uh, not real fucking happy about the witness's stance when it comes to refusing to serve or even salute the flag. Part of me feels bad that they were beaten and arrested, but also when you actively preach a version of who cares about this nation, I can't wait for God to come and burn it all down. Well, you're a fucking idiot to expect a lot of sympathy and protection from that same nation. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, it's like, reminds me of like some little kid. It's so childish. Like some little kid, like, I hate this place. I hate this place. All right, well, now you're kicked out. Hey, you can't do that to me. What? No, come on. <laughs> that's, not how it works. that's not how life works. Uh, in Germany, preaching activity is banned and the Watchtower Society headquarters are seized and closed. Thousands of witnesses are arrested in the 1920s. 1933, following the rise of Adolf Hitler, witnesses fired from their jobs. About 2,000 are imprisoned in concentration camps. They're the first Christian group to be persecuted in Nazi Germany, and they will be the most extensively persecuted Christian group. And of course they were. Again, based on their beliefs, not surprised. Hitler 
not known to be a real tolerant guy. Of course, he was going to be like, what? They hate Deutschland? All right, well, fuck them. Uh, this also happens in other countries. Witnesses in Japan, imprisoned, tortured. Members in the United States, Canada, Australia, Britain, also imprisoned as conscientious objectors. Witnesses banned in Germany in 1936. Uh, banned in Canada in 1940. Banned in Australia in 1941. Under Rutherford's leadership, you know, uh, a legal staff was developed to, and they would be unbanned, obviously, in those countries. Um, under Rutherford's leadership, a legal staff is developed to establish their right to preach, their right to refrain from nationalistic ceremonies, which I do think is so stupid. You're not your own country. Uh, between 1938 and 1955, the Watchtower Society wins 36 out of 45 religion-related court cases around the world. Uh, Rutherford is succeeded by Nathan Homer Knorr in 1942 after Joe Frank dies at the age of 72. Uh, before we move on from Rutherford, he, as president, um, was the president when the first Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall was built. In 1935, Rutherford was pr uh, present in Honolulu, Hawaii, when the very first Kingdom Hall was built, with free volunteer labor, of course, at 1228 Pensacola Street in Honolulu, Hawaii. First Kingdom Hall in the world, and it's still there. A uh, Kingdom Hall is the witness version of a church. Jehovah's Witnesses use Kingdom Halls for the majority of their worship and Bible instruction, better place to meet than people's houses or rented meeting halls. And it helps the witnesses, you know, build up their real estate holding wealth, which has become vast now. Witnesses prefer the term kingdom hall over church, noting that the term often translated into church in the Bible refers to the congregation of people rather than a structure. Many, if not most of these kingdom halls do not have windows. And that has creeped a lot of people out. Is it to keep, you know, their people from looking out the windows while they get, while they get brainwashed? Is it to keep others from looking in, observing their, their weird rituals? Their official answer is one I actually believe. The no window thing is just mostly about money. It's just cheaper to build places with no windows. And with volunteer labor, you often don't have the best builders. And so it's easier to build a place with no windows. And it cuts down on the possibility of break-ins and burglaries. Uh, for a group of people, you know, just killing time before the world ends, uh, I do believe this. They don't care much about how, you know, nice shit looks because, you know, they're waiting for God to burn it all down. Now let's move on to the reign of Nathan Homer Knorr that begins in 1942. None of the society's publications after 42 acknowledge who had written them. Instead, they are attributed now to an anonymous writing committee. From about 1944 on, the term governing body is used to refer to the Watchtower Society's seven-man board of directors, currently eight-man. Homer began to expand the witnesses' real estate holdings in Brooklyn, then expanded printing production throughout the world. Uh, he also organized a series of international assemblies that were way bigger than those of Joe Franks in the 1920s. 1958, more than 253,000 witnesses gather at two New York venues, Yankee Stadium and the Polo Grounds, for an eight-day convention where more than 7,000 are baptized. Under Homer's watch, new training schools were built, including the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead in Patterson, New York, under his eye uh, to train missionaries, and the Theocratic Ministry School on the shores of Africa's Lake Victoria in Tanzania to give instruction in preaching and public speaking at the congr uh, congregational level. Homer also commissioned a new translation of the Bible, which was released progressively from 1950 onwards before being published as the complete new world, new world translation of the Holy Scriptures in 1961. Another reason, a lot of Christians have problems with witnesses. They have their own Bible. Uh, 1961, Homer's witnesses make yet another doomsday prediction. This time they predict that the end of the world will arrive in the year 2000. So here we go again. At least with this one, they pushed the date out far enough for leadership to have plenty of time to enjoy all that donation money before they once again look like asshats. But then, five years later, they do something really stupid, and they bump up their doomsday predictions in 1966. Uh, the Watchtower says that Christ's kingdom on earth will be established fully by 1975. Should have stuck with 2000. You know, they just moved up inevitable embarrassment by 25 years. Uh, the September 15th, 1971 issue of the Watchtower warns that all worldly careers are soon to come to an end. They advise youths that they should not get interested in higher education for a future that will, that will never eventuate. Great job, guys. How many thousands and thousands of futures were completely fucked over with that prediction? Awesome work. Once again, you idiots. And they wonder why they are still being persecuted in many parts of the world, why they are so unpopular, real unpopular right now in Russia. They are currently banned there, labeled as an extremist group. And to be fair to Russia, I think they are an extremist group. Uh, I think they bring a lot of this persecution on themselves. The May 1974 issue of the Watchtower Society's newsletter, Our Kingdom Ministry, commends witnesses who have sold homes and property to devote themselves to preaching in their short time remaining. 
They regard the year 1975 a very promising date for the end of the world based on their original belief that it was the 6,000th anniversary of creation of both Adam and Eve at the Garden of Eden, or in the Garden of Eden in 4,026 BCE, which of course, zero, zero archaeological evidence supports or evolutionary evidence or common sense. Weird how people who favor doing mathematical calculations based on biblical interpretations uh, over science keep getting end time projections wrong. Membership does rise significantly in the years leading up to 1975, just like it, it had rose in the years leading up to that earlier 1920s, you know, end of the world prediction. Fear of an angry God, you know, coming to smite people real soon works. Some members sell their possessions, cash and insurance policies, etc. It all happens all over again in anticipation of the end, which never comes. How do church leaders not get fucking murdered in situations like this? Honestly, if I sold everything and fucked over my future based on continual evangelizing about how Armageddon is definitely about to happen and then that doesn't happen, I may legitimately kill somebody. I may legitimately kill the preacher in that situation. If one of these doomsday dudes were to get killed in a situation like this, I would feel zero empathy, sympathy, whatever. I would fucking laugh my ass off. Uh, the leadership structure of Jehovah's Witnesses reorganized starting January 1st, 1976 now with the power of the presidency passed to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and the establishment of six committees to oversee tasks such as writing, teaching, publishing, and evangelizing work. A lot of time, money, a lot of committees, uh, you know, invested in basically just uh, continuing to tell everyone that none of this shit will matter soon. At this time, Watchtower Society pub uh, publications began using the capitalized name. They were lowercase Jehovah's Witnesses before, now they're capital Jehovah's Witnesses. Also, following the world not ending 1975, membership, you know, drops off for a few years, just like it did back in the 20s, when some angry witnesses, you know, finally realized they'd fallen for some bullshit. Uh, 1977 now, President Nathan Homer Nor dies at the age of 72. Cerebral tumor got him. I bet he died super sad that he wasn't able to watch Invisible Jesus materialize and start beating down sinners. Uh, subsequent presidents of the Watchtower Society after Nor's death in 1977 are Frederick William Franz, who would lead from 77 to 92. When he died at the age of 99, man. Uh, Milton George Henschel who would lead uh, from 1992 to 2003 when he'll die at the age of 82. Don Adams will lead from 2003 to 2014 before he uh, yeah, dies at the age of 94 in 2019. So he, he left five years before he died. And then Robert Saranko, he has led since 2014. Currently 74, is alive. There's a bunch of pranks online about him dying of COVID. Does not seem to be true. Uh, you know, one old, joy-hating white man after another hoping for the world to end. Back to 1980 now. A purge of senior Brooklyn headquarters staff is carried out in April and May of 1980 after it's discovered that some uh, at the highest ranks of the hierarchy don't agree with early core Watchtower Society doctrines, particularly surrounding the significance of 1914. So these, uh, these guys can't all agree on the same craziness. In February, three governing body members, aware that people who had been alive in 1914 were rapidly dwindling in number, despite the additional Watchtower teaching that their generation would be alive to see Armageddon for sure, they now propose a radical change in Watchtower doctrines to require that the generation that would see the arrival of Armageddon had been alive only since 1957, the year of the launch of the Russian space satellite Sputnik. Obvious devil sign! Obvious sign of devil magic. The proposal, which would have extended the deadline for Armageddon by 43 years, fails to gain a majority vote. Those who wanted the change they're kicked the fuck out. The purge results in a number of schisms in the movement in Canada, Britain, and Northern Europe. Prompts the formation of loose groups of disaffected former witnesses. Of course, the Watchtower does not consider them real Jehovah's Witnesses, and these groups now are either, you know, super tiny or just, they fizzled out, they're just gone. What is happening? If all this seems confusing, it is, and you can blame the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're kicking out an average of three to four publications a year. They've been doing that for a century now, roughly. And they've been saying all kinds of shit and in addition to very specific predictions like the world ending, you know, by 1975, they also said stuff like the world would end before everyone alive in 1914 had died. They just can't stop trying to crack a code that if you're a non-believer like me, doesn't even exist. In 1983, a scandal befalls the kingdom. An expose called Crisis of Conscience is published by a former Jehovah's Witness named Raymond Franz three years after his expulsion or three years after he was disfellowshipped, as it's called the witness's version of being banned, excommunicated. Uh, the book is a major study and expose of the internal workings of the Watchtower during the 1960s and 70s, which have been mysterious to many people, including many witnesses themselves. Uh, Raymond Franz spent 43 years as a Jehovah's Witness. He was in deep, had an amazing pedigree, 
third generation witness. And not just any third generation witness. His uncle, Frederick William Franz, was the president I just mentioned, who led from 1977 to 92. Uncle Hans and Franz, not happy with Ray Ray about his expose. Raymond Franz began work uh, full time for the sect as soon as he finished high school. You know, raised in it, started serving as a full time preacher in the U.S. and as a missionary in Puerto Rico in the Dominican Republic. In 1965, he became a member of the religion's headquarters staff in Brooklyn, where he was assigned to help research and write the Bible Encyclopedia Aid to Bible Understanding. In 1971, appointed as a member of the religion's governing body. This guy was in high ranking member. Then he left the governing body in 1980 after a high-level inquiry was launched into allegations that several headquarters staff, including Franz, were spreading wrong teachings. Tight pants! On May 21st, 1980, Franz summoned Brooklyn for a fateful grilling by his governing body colleagues. Did he doubt that Jehovah had only chosen one organization to be God's organization? Did he question the official end times chronology? He did. And he was purged for that questioning. Q purge sirens. Raymond now found himself with few marketable skills, a $10,000 settlement from headquarters, and only $600 in personal savings. He turned to an old friend in the faith, Peter Gregerson of Gadsden, Alabama, who ran a regional supermarket chain to help him. Gregerson loaned uh, Franz and his wife a house trailer to live in, gave him work as a handyman. By 1981, Gregerson, uh, too, had begun to question Watchtower dogma and resigned from the faith. Six months later, the official Watchtower newspaper announced that the policy of shunning disfellowshipped witnesses, including shunning those like Gregerson, who had been disassociated, cult, cult, cult. We'll talk about the whole practice of shunning soon. Not long afterward, Raymond Franz was seen in a restaurant eating a meal with his benefactor, Gregerson. That single sighting provided the technical infraction for which Franz was officially disfellowshipped, kicked out. He would say, by one stroke, they eliminated all my years of service. I frankly do not believe there is another organization more insistent on 100% conformity. Cult, cult, cult. In the book, Franz wrote about how Jehovah's Witnesses uh, who chose to leave because they uh, cannot honestly agree with all the organization's teaching or policies are subsequently disfellowshipped or formally expelled and then shunned as apostates. One of the reasons for shunning could be something as simple as reading the Bible. By Franz's account, reading or studying the Bible is considered evil unless conducted in authorized discussions following Watchtower doctoral guides. Uh, He thought that was pretty fucked up. Because of his own work as an author of an official volume about the Bible, Franz privately concluded that the religion prioritized human organization rather than actual biblical teachings. He wrote, while producing people who uh, were outwardly moral, they subverted the essential qualities of humility, compassion, and mercy. He wrote that he hoped his book might prompt witnesses to consider the conscientious stand of defectors with a more open mind. He hoped that a discussion of deliberations and decisions of the governing body during his term would illustrate fundamental problems and serious issues within the organization. They demonstrate the extremes to which loyalty to an organization can lead, how it is basically how it is that basically kind, well-intentioned persons can be led to make decisions and take actions that are unkind, unjust, even cruel. Uh, His book does not prompt the witnesses to be more open-minded. They just keep on trucking. The doomsday is probably coming tomorrow. Express just keeps rolling down the track. Same as it it ever was. Back to our main history of their movement now. In 1984, the Watchtower has has now, excuse me, gone back to believing firmly the end of the world is going to happen by, you know, 2000 at the latest. They can't help themselves. (laughs) Uh, And then, then of course, it doesn't. Uh, Beginning in 2004, various Watchtower Society properties in Brooklyn are sold in preparation for the establishment of a new world headquarters in Warwick, New York, completed in 2016. And that's where Jehovah's Witnesses headquarters still stand today. Currently, Watchtower publications hint that the end of the world is going to occur in 2034. Why 2034? Because Noah preached 120 years until the time of the flood, which was the time of the end to Noah and his generation. And then they've done some funky math and added that into some other things. And they just, they fucking, they will not quit. Uh, let's hop out of this timeline now and dig further into the beliefs, practices, and structure of this very, very strange organization. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Let's look at how Jehovah's Witnesses meet first and what kind of places, what the religious ceremonies are like. Uh, meetings for worship and study are held, as I barely touched on earlier, in kingdom halls. And they are open to the public. Uh, Witnesses are assigned to a congregation in which territory they reside and are expected to attend weekly meetings as scheduled by the Watchtower Society and congregation elders. Weekend meetings are usually, but not always, held on Sundays. During meetings and in other formal circumstances, witnesses refer to one another as brother and sister. 
Two meetings each week are divided into five, five distinct sections, lasting a total of about four hours. Like in other churches, meetings are open and closed with hymns, although the witnesses refer to their hymns as kingdom songs. Uh, please, please allow me to sing part of one for you. Uh, if you're wearing tight pants or holding a pillow in between your legs, please don't sing along. Uh, please, don't, please don't bring Satan into this joyous hymn. Go put on your spib, or maybe your save, and, and get the devil out. This is uh, called a Jehovah's Attributes. <clears throat> I gotta, I gotta let it build a little bit, and then uh, <clears throat> I'll jump in. And I'll jump into the right time. You know, as far as far as I understand. <clears throat> Here we go. Okay, Jehovah, our God, exalted in might, Creator of life and Provider of light. Creation speaks of Your power so grand. The heavens and earth forever stand. Your heavenly throne on justice it stands. To us you make known all your righteous commands. And as we turn to your word, we can see your wisdom revealed so brilliantly. The greatest of all is your perfect love. Beyond all compare are your gifts from above. And I cannot wait to see the fate of evil sinners listening to pop music wearing swimsuits. Your glory will burn and stomp them out. I cannot wait to hear them scream in pain and shout. Then invisible Jesus, the King of Kings who beat Jerry Christ in the most important vote of votes will ride a trusty heaven steed and lop the heads off the Baptists and the Buddhists and people who watch movies. Please smile with your might and maybe use a laser beam or something cool to bring the fight to the devil who seems kind of weak because he can't even burn you in hell. So what's his game plan? Oh, oh God, please pick me for the heaven starting squad. Maybe I'm not in like the first 100,000 picks, but there's got to be room in the back 44,000 for me and for my mother and for my brother Terry, but maybe not my sister Mary. Her dress doesn't cover her ankles, and I cannot tell where her boobies are. I cannot tell where her boobies So I don't know exactly. <laughs> Confession time. I made up some of those lyrics. I, the first ones were legit, and it was hard for me to sing because I've never heard the melody, you know? But the music, fucking spot on. That comes straight from jdub.org. That's legit. <sighs> Witnesses attend, uh, witness attendees are urged to prepare for all Kingdom Hall meetings uh, by studying Watchtower Society literature. For the three of you who are still listening after that. Uh, selected by organization leadership and by looking up the related scripture. The weekend meeting, usually held on Sunday, uh, comprises a 30-minute public talk by a congregation elder and a one-hour question and answer study of a Bible-based article from the Watchtower magazine. So a little, little bit of Bible, a lot of the Watchtower. Uh, with questions prepared by the Watchtower Society, the answers provided in the magazine. Okay, got to make sure everyone comes to the correct conclusions. Cult, cult, cult. Uh, these meetings, both the community ones and the larger ones, very important. Sociologists who have studied them say that meetings at Kingdom Halls intensify witnesses' sense of belonging to a religious community and reinforce the idea that the world is ending soon. Even the Watchtower seems to admit this, saying that the uh, one role of the frequency and length of the meetings is to protect witnesses from becoming too involved in the affairs of the world. Stay away from Netflix and TikTok. You can't be TikToking and, you know, in spandex shorts if you want to get to heaven. Uh, witnesses are told they should never miss a meeting unless there is a serious reason, uh, reason. And witnesses are required to do more than show up at two meetings uh, a week as well. Uh, Watchtower Society also recommends that witnesses maintain a weekly family worship evening for family and personal study, you know, in addition to those two meetings. Uh, there's no formal way family worship meetings are supposed to happen, but no surprises here. The Society re recommends that members consider Watchtower Society publications during this time. Read the Watchtower. Don't just read the Bible willy-nilly and come up with your own ding-dong conclusions. That's how the devil gets you. Each year, witnesses from several congregations uh, will form a circuit and gather for two one-day assemblies. Then several circuits will meet once a year for a three-day regional convention. And then every few years, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses will hold international conventions in selected cities around the world. These are larger gatherings, usually held at rented stadiums. Uh, their most important and solemn event is the celebration of the Lord's evening meal, sometimes called the Memorial of Christ's Death. 
Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that this is the only celebration the Bible commands Christians to observe. Uh, they celebrated on uh, Nisan 14, according to the ancient Jewish Luna solar calendar. What the fuck? They can't even use a regular calendar. If you're curious, the next Nissan 14 is April 15th, 2022. Then it's April 5th, 2000, or 2023. Then April 22nd, 2024. Then April 12th, 2025. It's just fucking needlessly confusing. Uh, the memorial held after sunset includes a talk on the meaning of the celebration and the circulation among the audience of unadulterated red wine and unleavened, un, unleavened bread. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe the bread symbolizes Jesus Christ's body, which he gave on behalf of mankind. The wine symbolizes his blood, which redeems one from sin. But because many congregations have no members who will claim to be anointed, very common for no one to eat the bread and no one to drink the wine. And it just gets thrown in the trash at the end of the service like God intended. <laughs> Not kidding. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that being anointed involves a personal revelation by God's spirit, which gives positive assurance of adoption to that individual alone. They believe only the 144,000 are anointed. So if you drink that bread or wine, you are basically announcing to your congregation that invisible Jesus has told you that you're one of the chosen few. Most Christians believe that anyone who's accepted Jesus as their personal savior are anointed. To be anointed simply means that you have the Holy Spirit in you, that you were chosen by God and to be chosen, you just have to choose Christ. So pretty easy application process. How weird just to lay out a bunch of bread and wine <laughs> and they just throw it all away. Uh, let's pivot now to what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Uh, witnesses hold a number of traditional evangelical Christian views, like many we've covered in other sucks, including the recent suck about the aggressive Christian missionary training core cult, but they also have many beliefs very unique to them. Witnesses affirm that God, Jehovah, is the most high. Jehovah is a Latinized form of the Hebrew name of God used in some translations of the Bible. Uh, witnesses also believe that Jesus Christ is God's agent on earth, and through Jesus, sinful meat sacks can be reconciled to God, and that the Holy Spirit is the name of God's active force in the world. But they think uh, that these are three distinct entities, that Jesus is God's son, not God, not as powerful as God, and there could be more of God's sons later. Like many evangelicals, Jehovah's Witnesses believe they are under obligation to God to give witness by participating in organized and spontaneous evangelizing. Uh, prospective members are told they have a moral obligation to serve as publishers by participating in the Witnesses' organized preaching work. Qualifying as an unbaptized publisher is a requirement for baptism. And the way you become a publisher is by going from door to door, telling people about the quote truth. You got to hand out doomsday literature, convince people that God's wrath is coming and you better join our weird little club. If you want to have a lottery ticket chance of getting into heaven, children usually accompany parents on these visits or go with other elders. Uh, in addition to door to door preaching, witnesses are taught that they should seek opportunities to witness informally by starting conversations with people they meet during routine activities. Like, you know, when they're out shopping or on public transport you know, direct the conversation towards their beliefs. And that has never happened to me. What a bummer. I must project a pretty strong vibe of not interested. Unfortunate, since I would love to be bothered about this kind of stuff. I'm sure the conversation would eventually get deliciously uncomfortable. Uh, basically, anything bad happening in the news, current events, whatever, that's a cue for Watchtower, uh, you know, uh, the Watchtower to say that the witnesses need to preach more. Uh, much like Keith Raniere's Nexium cult and those stupid sashes, you can level up by preaching more. Members who commit themselves to evangelize for 840 hours per year, an average of 70 hours per month, they get to be called regular pioneers. But no trophy and no cool t-shirt, no gift certificate to Dave and Buster's. Just a title, honestly, that doesn't even sound that cool. It sounds like they didn't think that hard about these titles. Regular pioneers? Come on. How about like Trailblazer or Invisible Jesus Ranger? That sounds better than regular pioneer. Uh, those who commit themselves to evangelize for 50 hours uh, for one month are called auxiliary, auxiliary pioneers. Uh, some witnesses go uh, even more above and beyond. They volunteer for special missionary service. These uh, poor people dedicate on average more than 120 hours per month to their work. Uh, members who are not able to pioneer are told they can maintain the pioneer spirit by spending as much time as they can helping others preach. Guessing these, uh, those regular pioneers really look down on those who only have a little bit of pioneer spirit. There's a whole lot of other vocabulary for people. That's a lot of complicated bullshit. Like the term minister for all Jehovah's Witnesses who have been approved to formally evangelize. They call their baptisms ordinations. Uh, unbaptized publishers are considered regular minister ministers. Uh, baptized publishers are considered ordained ministers. Other than going door to door, witnesses are also instructed to organize information marches. That's when they wear sandwich boards and hand out leaflets. Uh, they've also spread their message doing super fun and not obnoxious at all shit like driving around cars with speakers, blasting sermons, and publishing articles in newspapers. 
Uh, you drive with your speakers around our office enough, witnesses, and I swear to God, I'll slash your fucking tires. I predict that Jehovah will not stop me from doing that. During the recent pandemic, many Jehovah's Witnesses focused on alternative methods of evangelism, such uh, as online web applications, telephone, email, SMS texting, regular old snail mail. Please send me a spam text, witnesses. Would love to open up a text thread and see where it goes. Right? We'll play a little game of uh, who blocks who. I bet I'll block, uh, you know, or you'll block me before I block you. All this, how much you preach, what your rank is, you know, even which houses you visit, it's all kept track of very meticulously. God's Armageddon accountants will not forget to add up all your good deeds. Uh, witnesses are instructed to fill out monthly report slips on their preaching activity, listing the hours they spent preaching, the publications they gave to people, the number of return visits they made to people who seemed interested, kind of like how a company tracks the success of its sales force. With these reports, elders measure members' spirituality. Ay ay ay. How spiritual are you? Well, you're not getting many return visits, so, you know, I guess God doesn't fucking like you that much or you don't care that much about God. Uh, they got to establish whether or not people are eligible to be elders, to be ministerial or ministerial servants. And if one of these people uh, gets to you, if you start believing that they're actually in possession of the truth, you can expect to have to prove how serious you are about becoming a Jehovah's Witness. You'll have to take a Bible study course for several months when you join. You'll have to go to meetings at kingdom halls, show your elders that you're willing to go door to door with everyone else. Before you're able to get baptized, you'll have to have discussions with elders based on questions provided by the Watchtower Society. They are not interested in any half-assed slackers joining their ranks. People who can walk the walk only, please. Then if you can pass their little fucked up pop quiz, you get baptized and you get rewarded with less than a 1% chance of salvation. That 144,000 number just kills me. You know, a lot of members have to hate that. It's got to make it so hard to get new converts. Imagine how hard it would be to be a door-to-door -door salesman if you were not selling knives, for example, but were selling a small chance to win those knives. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Hey, uh, name's Joe Frank, and do I, do I have a deal for you? Uh, would you like a set of never have to be sharpened uh, microcarbate stainless steel knives? Well, for just $10, I can sell you a ticket that gives you a one in five million chance of winning these knives at a yet to be determined date. Uh, if you do pass their quiz, you'll most likely get baptized in a pool, probably at a bigger assembly or convention because it makes for a great photo op. A lot of people get baptized at once. Before you get in the water, you make a public declaration about your dedication to Jehovah. Then a speaker will ask you two questions. Have you repented of your sins, dedicated yourself to Jehovah, and accepted his way of salvation through Jesus Christ? Feels like that first question is really three questions, but whatever. Then you're asked, do you understand that your baptism identifies you as one of Jehovah's witnesses in association with Jehovah's organization? After you say yes, you get dunked in the water, and now, ta-da, you're a Jehovah's witness. Hope you got all the blowjobs you ever wanted before you joined. Hope you got that pussy licked. Because fun time's over now. And Lucifina wept. Uh, let's look further into what beliefs you just agreed to subscribe to as a freshly dunked Jehovah's Witness. The core notion embraced by Jehovah's Witnesses is, of course, that Armageddon is imminent. And that the only way to be saved from a terrible end times death is to religiously abide by their tenets, which are dispensed by the Watchtower governing body, a ruling council of male elders who function as God's earthly vessels. Currently eight old white dudes. Once Armageddon kicks off, witnesses granted access to what they uh, will be granted access to what they call the new system, a post-apocalyptic paradise, where they can begin to live their real lives as opposed to their new, uh, their current new system prologue existences in the here and now. Because here's this thing, it's all kind of weird, but it's like the 144,000 they get to go to heaven when they die, but the but the faithful Jehovah's Witnesses when the rapture comes and God smites everybody, they get to finish their regular lives here on Earth, but like in a super fun paradisey way. Uh, the new system is this reality, you know, uh, that'll exist when, when Michael, the archangel, AKA Jesus Christ, they do believe they're one and the same. Uh, when Jesus, Michael Christ slaughters every man, woman, and child and baby that doesn't align themselves with the Watchtower Society in America, uh, the new system is according to Watchtower literature and some super fun illustrations. It looks like some kind of vegetarian socialist utopia where the dead are resurrected and everyone owns a pet tiger and a panda apparently. And they walk around in seventies, loose fitting polyester slacks, like, like petting lions and stuff. It's fucking super weird. Follow the rules and you're golden. Disobey or even question the rules and you risk, you know, being disfellowshipped, excommunicated. Uh, you know, and if you've been in long enough, being disfellowshipped, you know, removes you from friends, family, the only community you've ever known. Cult, cult, cult. Those who acknowledge Jehovah in this life will become members of the millennial kingdom. Maybe, but probably not because of the 144,000 numbers that I talked about. Those who reject him will for sure not go to hell, but will just face extinction. Witnesses are encouraged to devote themselves to bringing more converts into the religion before the end of the world arrives. Uh, in 2010, Watchtower literature introduced the overlapping generations theory. 
which claims that the end times will come before the death of everyone who was alive at the same time as anyone who was alive in 1914. They fucked up so many predictions. They're just making it like weirder and weirder now. Uh, like Scientology and a lot of other cults, like our own cult of the curious, you know, they have a lot of in vocab terms to describe each other. Some of the stuff we went over. Uh, disfellowshipped. Uh, PIMO, short for physically in, mentally out. Uh, the two witness rule, you know, scriptural decree, which states that no Jehovah's Witness can be officially accused of something, uh, of committing a sin without two corroborating eyewitness accounts. Horrific, as I mentioned earlier. And, and we'll deal with this. So we'll talk about that more when we get into the allegations about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses later. Uh, members are expected to follow a strict code of personal conduct. Marriage is considered a holy convent. Divorce is disapproved of, except in cases of adultery, abuse, neglect, or if your partner is no longer a witness, then it's encouraged. Families are patriarchal, with the husband considered the final author final authority on family decisions. That part's that part's pretty sweet. I'll let Lindsay know shortly that that is what God wants. She currently does not listen to me on all matters. Crazy. She's like, oh, I have my own brain. Oh, <laughs> that's not what God said. Uh, weddings, anniversaries, funerals are observed. Though they avoid incorporating certain traditions, uh, they believe to have pagan origins. Uh, the Watchtower has stated that the use of wedding rings by witnesses is, uh, witnesses is acceptable, even though wedding rings may have been first used by pagans based on their conclusion that there's no definitive evidence wedding rings were used as part of pagan religious practices. Okay. Uh, witnesses typically do observe wedding anniversaries with the Watchtower Society noting that wedding anniversaries apparently do not stem from pagan origins, but there's no Halloween, no Christmas, no Easter celebration, no birthdays. Right? I'm sure a lot of you remember a kid in school who had to say no to those cupcakes getting passed around. Or you were that kid yourself. No fun for the witness child. Even Mother's Day has a pagan origin, supposedly. Like many other conservative Christian sects, abortion, you know, considered murder, homosexuality, premarital sex, extramarital sex, considered serious sins. God hates sex. He especially hates it when you stick a peen in a poop hole loophole. Especially, extra especially, if that loophole is near some dude's tiddlywinks. Man butt loopholes full of so much devil, full of a little extra devil, especially when they're constipated. Gosh dang, that peeves God. Uh, smoking, including vaping, abuse of drugs, and drunkenness are prohibited, though alcohol is permitted in moderation. Makes total sense. God hates weed and shrooms, but he, but he likes the occasional beer. Everyone who knows anything about God knows that. Uh, the society stresses dressing modestly and that if members don't dress modestly, they could cause others to stumble on the religious path and fall right into Satan's nest. Right? God hates tight jeans and short skirts. We went over that. Those lead to boners and wet pusses. God hates those. Uh, entertainment promoting immoral, demonic, or violent themes like this podcast are considered very inappropriate. No surprises there. If you're a witness listening to this podcast, whoa, whoa, better not tell any of your elders. Better not let any pioneers or publishers or jugglers or peggers or sword swallowers or half elf paladins or fucking whatever, uh, you know, find out that your time's sucking. God hates me and hates the show. Uh, guessing your witness brethren would not laugh if your Bluetooth disconnected and they heard some of this, you became a Cummins Law victim. You'd be quickly disfellowed, disfellowshipped, which might suck at first, but you writing in about that would probably be one of the greatest time sucker updates of all time. Uh, uh, and after acclimating you know, to life outside the witnesses, I think you'll probably be a lot happier. Uh, the witnesses' teachings also st uh, stress strict separation from uh, all secular government Although they are generally law-abiding and believe the governments are established by God to maintain some peace and order, they refuse on biblical grounds to observe certain laws. For example, they will not salute the flag of any nation because they think that's an act of false worship. Uh, they refuse to perform military service, which has made them very unpopular in nations that require military service. Uh, they won't participate in public elections, which means as a voting base, they don't fucking matter. Uh, they do pay taxes, but only because they have to or they end up in jail. Uh, they can't work in any government post. Instead of believing they're beholden to any kind of secular legal system, as I mentioned earlier, they have their own internal processes for dealing with shit. They like to, they like to deal with problems in-house, big time. Formal discipline is administered by congregation elders. In the event that an accusation of serious sin is made concerning a baptized member, the elders, they will talk to the accused individual. If it's determined that a serious sin has been committed, a tribunal or judicial committee, usually composed of three elders, almost always old white men, is formed to determine guilt, administer help, and possibly apply sanctions. Disfellowshipping is the most severe sanction. Before taking this step, the judicial committee must determine that the individual has committed a serious sin and there's evidence of true, and there's no evidence, excuse me, of true repentance. After a person is disfellowshipped, the person is then shunned by all baptized members. Uh, reproof, another form of sanctioning. Members considered truly repentant are reproved rather than disfellowshipped. 
Reproof is given before all onlookers based on an interpretation of 1 Timothy. Uh, but those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that others may take warning. If the sin is known generally by the entire congregation or the community, an announcement is made informing the congregation that one person has been reproved. Teddy has been reproved. He wore tight pants three days in a row. He knows what he did and he will be wearing hammer pants going forward. Uh, reproved members usually have some congregation privileges restricted until the elders decide that the member has regained spiritual strength. Mostly these privileges are, you know, things like getting to speak in meetings and getting to pray for a particular group. Uh, another form of sanctioning is called marking. Marking is applied when a member's course of action is a violation of the Bible's principles, but isn't worth getting disfellowshipped for. Maybe the pants aren't that tight. The person gets counseling, and they, if they don't respond to it in the way that the society wants, they get marked, which means that an announcement is made to the group saying that someone's actions are wrong. Teddy's pants are kind of tight, and we don't care for it, and that's why he sits in the naughty corner. Uh, marked people are not shunned completely, but their social contact is limited. Don't, don't talk to Teddy today. Uh, as crazy as these practices and beliefs are, uh, the big one to reach the news, and one you might already know about, is the uh, Jehovah's Witness ban on blood transfusions, even in a dire medical emergency. This is based on their interpretation of scriptures like Leviticus 17.10 uh, um, uh, and 11. I will certainly set my face against the one who is eating the blood and Acts 15.29, abstain from blood. Um, actually, I think it's just that, yeah, verse, Leviticus 17, 10, sorry. Uh, interesting they follow this Leviticus directive, but ignore so many others, like Leviticus 17, 3. Ye eat neither fat nor blood, or 1927. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Or when God says uh, in chapter 21 that you should not allow dwarves in your congregation. Not joking. Whosoever he be of thy seed and their generation that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. And then a bunch of different people are listed, including dwarves. Uh, the book of Leviticus is full of so much crazy shit. Literally no denomination accepts all this book as actual rules you should follow. So why pick any out? Why accept any of them? Just like it's weird and nonsensical to focus just on homosexuality, also weird to single out and focus on blood transfusions. This idiotic policy has led to numerous deaths and lawsuits over the years. In one case, a 16-year-old was in an automobile accident, needed surgery, surgery that would require blood transfusions. Physicians attempted to persuade the patient and his mom, uh, divorced with custody of her son, to consent to the transfusion. She turned them down. When the surgeon told the patient's mom that the patient was in imminent danger of dying from his injuries without the blood transfusion, and she denied them yet again, preferring that her son would literally just die instead of get medical treatment that was you know, readily available, that she considered a sin, the hospital took action. The hospital's legal counsel filed a petition in the state court to appoint a legal guardian for the 16-year-old patient to get them a transfusion. The state quickly appointed a judge. The patient's condition got worse over the following days until the guardian decided that he needed the blood transfusion or he was definitely going to die. Uh, excuse me, the patient had to be restrained, was administered three units of packed red blood cells. And after that, because of this transfusion, the patient recovered and was discharged one and a half months later, lived, hail Nimrod. Mom should have been thankful that her son lived, but of course was not. She got pissed and she sued the hospital. Fucking sick of Bojangles. Go get her. In 2019, a Jehovah's Witness woman died in a Pennsylvania hospital because she didn't get a blood transfusion and then her family tried to sue the hospital for wrongful death. That lawsuit, thankfully, thrown out. So many cases like this, infuriating. With kids under age 18, I do not think parents should be allowed to deny them things like blood transfusions, regardless of religion. If you're over 18, though, and you've decided that you should not get the transfusion you need, you need to survive, well, all right, fine, go ahead and die. Maybe hopefully, maybe hopefully die before you have kids and raise them to also make decisions like this. Maybe harsh, I know, but come on. If someone is this committed and determined to be that stupid, why should the rest of us care about their welfare? Uh, die in your own terms, I guess. Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that giving blood is bad. They claim that storing blood violates direction from the Bible to pour blood out onto the ground. Also dumb. Uh, now that we know more about some of their more peculiar beliefs, let's take a look at the bigger picture again. Is being a Jehovah's Witness, uh, you know, being in a cult? It's a debate we've had here before with the LDS Church and Scientology specifically. You already know my answer, but I'll walk you through how I got there. Many, it seems, possibly most sociologists and religious scholars have said that witnesses are cult members, basing this on witnesses' tendency to elevate peripheral teachings such as door-to-door -door preaching to great prominence, leaning on an extra scriptural source of authority like the Watchtower, uh, saying that the Bible may be understood only as interpreted by the governing body, and that the group views itself as the exclusive community of the saved, all of which is true. Watchtower publications do teach 
that witnesses alone are God's people and that they alone will survive Armageddon. Witness publications also claim the group was called into existence by God to fill a gap in the truth neglected by existing churches, making them the sort of end of days vanguard type common in cults. Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, state that they are not a cult, say that although individuals need proper guidance from God, they should do their own thinking, but they don't actually practice that. Uh, Ex-cult watchdog John Bowen Brown II, several others have rejected the assertion that Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. The Encyclopedia uh, Contemporary American Religion states various critics and ex-members in recent years have wrongly labeled Jehovah's Witnesses as a cult. So is it a cult or not? Let's go through some cult criteria. First off, a cult has a single unquestioned leader who makes all the rules with no accountability and usually he's fucking a lot of people. So that does not seem to be the case with Jehovah's Witnesses. Second, you have cohabitation. Uh, cult members often live, live in a group or commune, often with the leader. Remember Deborah Green from the ACMTC. Members are often not allowed to leave the cult or even the cult compound. Uh, even temporary excursions among outsiders are done in pairs or in groups with a trusted member always present. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do not always live together, but there are many communities and a lot of stories we'll go over later where people have found it very hard to leave because their business uh, depends on other witnesses hiring them. Their entire social circle is, you know, dependent on other, you know, members. So I I'm going to say maybe for this, I mean, it's not a compound, but it's compound like and how insular the world of the witness becomes thanks to a variety of church policies designed to do that, to separate them from other people, to have them not form any close relationships with outsiders. Uh, third, this plays into that isolation. Members are often not allowed to interact, socialize with outsiders, uh, frequently required to separate from their friends and families. So, you know, yeah, check. Uh, they definitely isolate people. If a member is disfellowshipped, they are expected to be shunned by a baptized member. Uh, witnesses are told to literally physically turn away from members who have been shunned. Don't even, uh, you know, look at them. Uh, don't talk to them. You know, very culty. Fourth is coercion. Cults use recruitment methods, often including sleep deprivation, withholding of food or bathroom breaks, forced labor, uh, not giving their members time or space to engage with different ideas. I'm going to go with a soft yes on this one. Spending all your free time doing door-to-door -door preaching probably counts as some kind of deprivation or forced labor. Uh, they're not supposed to read anything that isn't watchtower material. They're expected to shun as much of the secular world as possible. Fifth, repetition. Cult members are told what to believe on a daily basis with intense, though often subtle, indoctrination techniques used to hold members. The few items that distinguish that cult are repeated endlessly. I mean, that's a big yes. The constant Armageddon talk. Clearly what they are expected to think about the most. Uh, six, exclusiveness. Cult initiates are told that only select members of the cult will reach the ultimate goal. This is incentive to stay and be more dedicated to the cult. Yes. Big, big time, yes. All that pioneer, auxiliary pioneer, ordained versus regular minister, uh, et cetera, talk. The uh, 144,000 talk, only the best, most faithful witnesses. You know, records kept on how well they're doing with their preaching. You know, all that stuff feeds into this. Seven, alienation. Cult adherents are encouraged or even bullied into thinking in terms of us versus them with total alienation from them. Big yes. Members are constantly warned about being pulled into the secular world. You know, of being pulled away from the spiritual world by, you know, like in all the tight pants talk. Uh, the devil is everywhere outside of their insular world of meetings, formless, plain clothes, preaching about the apocalypse, that kind of shit. And then eighth, totalitarian and controlling. Cults ask significantly more time and money from their adherents, often asking for a person's life savings to progress in the organization. They are usually totalitarian and demand that the individual give themselves up to the organization or theology. When cult members give money, there's no accountability for how it's spent. I mean, that's, that's a kind of. They are controlling. They hang the threat of being disfellowshipped over members' heads constantly, but they don't ask for all of their members' money. And they are pretty transparent actually in showing where a lot of the money goes, but they do expect them to work for them for free and to donate everything they can and not spend money on secular world luxury since it's, you know, ending soon. So I've got one hard no, two maybes, five yeses. One of them is pretty soft out of eight categories. So just, I for me, just barely tips into officially being, you know, cult, cult, cult. I do think they're a cult of sorts, like Scientology. They don't all live on a compound, but cult mentality. Not living on a doomsday compound, getting literally fucked by a cult leader, but also not a casual laid back system of religious beliefs where it's like, hey, you know, you can kind of come and go. Uh, I certainly would be, I, I would be very worried and sad if a family, family member or a friend told me they had joined. It all seemed just so incredibly negative. Continually focusing on an impending apocalypse, worshiping a God that seems to never want you to feel good or experience any pleasure. A God who demands strict obedience and in return probably is not even going to reward you with anything that positive. It sounds absolutely terrible in every way. And if you push back on all that, you're shunned? Yeah, yeah, fuck all this. Very culty. 
Now let's talk about some very sad, serious, troubling, tragic, and largely avoidable scandals. If my anger towards the witnesses did not seem justified so far, I really hope this will change it. Uh, back in March of 1997, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the nonprofit organization that oversees the Jehovah's Witnesses, sent a letter to each of its 10,883 U.S. congregations and to many more congregations worldwide. The organization was concerned about a legal risk posed by possible child molesters within its ranks. The letter laid out instructions on how to deal with a known sexual predator. Go to the police, help the investigation any way you can, support the victim and or victims. If the system fails, kill that motherfucker. Uh, JK. Unfortunately, JK. Uh, no, the instructions were, write out a detailed report answering 12 questions. Was this a one-time occurrence? Were they just dabbling and diddling? Or did the accused have a history of child molestation? How is the accused viewed within the community? Good guy when he's not sticking his ween in underage loopholes? Does anyone else know about the abuse? This reads to me as, can we cover it up? And there were other numerous questions. And then witnesses were to mail this to Watchtower headquarters in a special blue envelope. Also keep a copy of the report in the congregation's confidential file and don't share it with anyone else. This was a follow-up to a 1989 letter in which uh, Watchtower discouraged elders from reporting wrongdoing to civil authorities very clearly. Part of that letter read, elders share the obligation to shepherd the flock. However, they must be careful not to divulge information about personal matters to unauthorized persons. There is, quote, a time to keep quiet when your words should prove to be few. Ecclesiastes 3, 7, and 5, 2. Proverbs 10, 19 warns, in the abundance of words, there does not fail to be transgression, but the one keeping his lips in check is acting discreetly. Often the peace, unity, and spiritual well-being of the congregation are at stake. Improper use of the tongue by an elder can result in serious legal problems for the individual the congregation, and even the society, as in the Watchtower Society. While we as Christians are ready to forgive others who may wrong us, those in the world are not so inclined. Worldly persons are quick to resort to lawsuits if they feel that their quote-unquote rights have been violated. Some who oppose the kingdom preaching work readily take advantage of any legal provisions uh, to interfere with it or impede its progress. Thus, elders must especially guard the use of the tongue. Jesus faced opposers who tried to, quote, catch him in speech so as to turn him over to the government. Luke 2020. Wow. Uh, victims' rights in quotes, in quotes there. They just quoted scripture to justify hiding criminals in their midst, including, based on the history I'm going to share, sexual predators. Does that feel pretty evil? Feels pretty evil to me. Uh, these creepy governing body piles of shit continue with, in recent years, this matter has come to be a cause for increasing concern. The spirit of the world has sensitized people regarding their legal rights and the legal means by which they can exact punishment if such rights are violated. Hence, a growing number of vindictive or disgruntled ones, as well as opposers, have initiated lawsuits to inflict financial penalties on the individual, the congregation, or the society. Many of these lawsuits are the result of the misuse of the tongue. As elders, remember that ill-advised statements or actions on your part can sometimes be interpreted legally as violating others' rights. Anything submitted in writing to the committee by the alleged wrongdoer or by witnesses should be kept in strict confidence. If it is necessary to continue at a later time, a committee hearing, the members of the committee should submit the chairman any personal notes they have taken. The chairman will keep these notes in a secure place to prevent breaches of confidentiality. Upon conclusion of the case, the chairman should place only necessary notes and documents, a summary of the case, and the S7, S77 forms in a sealed envelope for the congregation file. Nothing should be preserved outside of this sealed envelope, including unnecessary personal notes, or by an elder or the committee. Obviously, no committee will ever allow judicial proceedings to be tape recorded or allow witnesses testifying before the committee to take notes. <laughs> Obviously! If you, if you prove that you're liable in a crime, we're not going to record that. <laughs> Come on, don't worry. We're not going to take notes. Help save our holy organization by making sure our members can keep quietly fucking kids. And that is what all this is really about. Here's where we start to get to the part about molestation. Many states have child abuse reporting laws. When elders receive reports of physical or sexual abuse of a child, they should contact the society's legal department immediately. Victims of such abuse need to be protected from further danger. Uh, not contact the police. No, contact the society's legal department, as in the Watchtower Society's lawyers, because they have their own legal offices. Uh, you can connect with them on their website right now if you want. You can probably report some sexual abuse. They'll be happy to hide for you. They continue. 
In some cases, the elders will form judicial committees to handle alleged wrongdoing. That also could constitute a violation of Caesar's criminal laws, e.g. theft, assault, etc. You know, Caesar is in the government. Generally, a secular investigation to the matter that is a concern to the congregation should not delay conducting a judicial hearing. To avoid entanglement with the secular authorities who may be investigating the same matter, the stricter confidentiality, even of the fact that there is a committee, must be maintained. Don't snitch like we talked about last week. Don't talk about it. Don't cooperate with authorities. You know, what you're doing, you know, with our blessing is technically very illegal, so shut the fuck up. They continue, if the alleged wrongdoer confesses to the sin, crime, no one else should be present besides the members of the committee. When evidence supports the accusation, but genuine repentance is not displayed, resulting in a decision to disfellowship, this should be handled in the normal course regarding advice of appeal rights and announcements to the congregation. In cases of serious, serious criminal wrongdoing, e.g. murder, rape, etc., where the criminal conduct is widely known in the community, the body of elders should contact the society before proceeding with the judicial committee process. Wow, contact the society first, even in cases of murder and rape. Not the police. Now, let them figure out if they can cover it up or not. Advice like this is how the Jehovah's Witnesses built what might be the world's largest database of undocumented child molesters, at least two decades worth of names and addresses, likely numbering in the tens of thousands and detailed acts of alleged abuse, most of which have never been shared with law enforcement, all scanned and searchable in a Microsoft SharePoint file somewhere. Watchtower has refused to comply with multiple court orders to release information containing its database and has paid millions of dollars over the years to keep it a secret, even from survivors whose stories are contained in the file. They have an army of lawyers they're able to hire with those uh, very deep pockets they've gotten thanks to donations from members, donations in many cases from the families of victims. Man, fuck the Watchtower. Uh, truly glad they're being persecuted around the world. With policies like this, they fucking deserve it. Exactly how many alleged pedophiles are named in the database has been the source of wide-ranging speculation. In 2002, one former elder said the number was 23,720. That was almost 20 years ago. Almost 24,000 pedophiles. And most don't victimize just one kid. How many kids did those 23,705 molest? 100,000? 200,000? We have no idea. Thankfully, some people are trying to change that. Like ex-witness Mark O'Donnell. He left the religion in late 2013. His parents, Jerry and Susan, had started attending Jehovah's Witness meetings in the mid-60s after another couple from Baltimore told them of Watchtower, uh, Watchtower's prediction, you know, that the world would end in 1975, bringing death to all non-witnesses, transforming earth into a paradise for the faithful. So fear, 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 it worked. 1968, just after Mark is born, Jerry and Susan are group baptized in a swimming pool in Washington, D.C. As a kid, he attends at least five meetings a week plus several additional weekly hours of private Bible study. Cult, cult, cult. On Saturday mornings, he joins his parents in field service, knocking on doors in search of new converts. He's taught that most people outside the organization are corrupted by Satan. And given half a chance, they'll try and steal from him, drug him, rape him. Uh, he's taught that mainstream books and magazines are considered the work of Satan. If he broke any of the religion's main rules, he'll be disfellowshipped, meaning that even his own family will shun him. Cult, cult, cult. Throughout Mark's childhood, he hears elders often cite Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever holds back his rod hates his son. Mark's parents took the lesson to heart and beat him frequently. The God of Jehovah's Witnesses, to me, sounds like a real piece of shit. Loves to beat kids, hates boners, hates puss, uh, loves hiding pedophiles. Uh, when he was 12, Mark became suspicious of a local witness named Louis uh, Ongsinko, a single flight attendant, Ongsinko, a single flight attendant and self-appointed Pied Piper of children called himself a pie piper, uh, creepy, uh, who would bring home, uh, I can never, Tobol, Tobolone. It's a candy that Lindsay gets, actually, and I can never remember how to say it. It's these candy bars, T-O-B-L-E-R-O-N-E. -E. You've seen them, they're always at airports. He'd bring these candy bars back for local witness kids and invite them to his apartment to act out religious plays. My God. He's luring kids to his apartment with candy, literally. Not suspicious at all there. Uh, Mark noticed uh, Obsinko touching young girls in a way that made him uncomfortable. This guy was also a masseuse and he would massage these girls, told an elder about his concerns rather than take action. You know, the elder told uh, Ong Sinko what Mark had said, fucking ratted him out to the guy who's, you know, molesting kids. Maybe that elder was a pedo too. A few days later, Ong Sinko pulls Mark aside, scolds him. Uh, and Mark's instincts were correct. Years later in 2001, one of Mark's childhood friends, Aaron Michelle Shiflett, along with four other women, all sue Ong Sinko for sexual assault. 
Their cases were settled out of a court out of court for an undisclosed sum, and then uh, Ong Sinko died in 2016. Apparently, he'd been raping these girls for years. Uh, Mark's life and the witnesses, representative of so many others. When Mark wanted to go to college, his parents told him the world was ending soon, so why bother? So he didn't. At the age of 17, despite having already knocked out a year of college credit via high school and a guidance counselor imploring him to apply to college, he decides, you know, just to stop with his high school diploma. He's baptized, uh, then starts his exercise equipment repair company. The business provides enough flexibility for him to perform 50 hours of field service for the witnesses every month, which qualifies him for the rank of auxiliary pioneer. Uh, one day when Mark was installing a sound system in a new kingdom hall in Baltimore, fall of 1997, a young woman named Kimmy Weber asked to borrow his ladder. At 20 years old, Kimmy was putting in more than 90 hours of field service in a month, making her a full-fledged pioneer. She was really in. She had completed a two-year program in a community college on a scholarship, and then later she got permission from local elders to get her bachelor's degree. Fucking permission to get a bachelor's degree. With some old dudes running her congregation. Cult, cult, cult. Uh, Mark was drawn to her drive and intensity. He tracked down her email address. They flirted over AOL Instant Messenger. Eight months later, they were married. They wanted to start a family, but they decided to wait until after the rapture. You know, when the earth and their kids would be perfect. When Jesus Michael Christ was done smiting and burning evildoers and whatnot. In the meantime, Kimmy began opening uh, their home to abused and abandoned cats. Uh, Mark's business, uh, his, his business grows. He brings on additional employees, mostly other witnesses. When he and Kimmy have enough money to uh, buy the house across the street as a rental property, they fill its three units with other witnesses. Uh, they go on some ski vacations, softball games, dinner parties. They have game nights, always with other witnesses. They're having as much fun as Jesus will allow. Uh, Mark is happy-ish. He likes his friends, but he is aware that he's living in a J-Dub bubble, in a, in a J-Dub echo chamber. Uh, he'd also been hearing rumors that Watchtower organization, or that the Watchtower organization was covering up cases of pedophilia and child abuse. You know, uh, uh, suspicions that Watchtower publications would always dismiss as, you know, apostate-driven lies. You know, the devil trying to bring him down with slander and gossip. Then one day, a few years after he and Kimmy get married, Mark sees a protester outside a witness convention holding up a sign that reads, a JW elder molested me. He looks at the sign, something snaps into place in his brain. He just feels in his gut that this dude's not lying. And then he can't stop thinking about this guy. He thinks about him for years. And then in 2013, he's finally ready to leave the church. 2013 is the, is the year Mark has an extreme reaction to an antibiotic. And he ends up confined to his couch for several weeks, removed from constant meetings, constant Bible studies for the first time in his life. He's left alone with his thoughts for the first time in his adult life, and he begins to admit to himself that he no longer believes the apocalypse is imminent. Sacrilege. And he always, uh, you know, felt that Jehovah's Witnesses he knew were no more deserving of God's mercy than many non-believers he'd met. He admits this to himself. He was 45 years old now in poor health, and he wondered how much more of his life did he want to waste inside the J-Dub bubble he'd always been in. That November, as he and Kimmy are preparing to spend the weekend at a friend's house, he suddenly stops packing, and he just tells Kimmy he's done. He can't, you know, maintain the facade anymore and he will never attend another meeting. Kimmy, not ready to leave. She keeps going to meetings. And now her witness friends try to pressure her to divorce, uh, you know, her husband, Mark, because, you know, he's not a witness anymore. They tell her Jehovah comes first. Cult, cult, cult. She doesn't want to leave Mark though. She's trying to figure out a way for her to stay a witness, you know, while Mark is no longer in the church. Luckily, their connection is stronger than the powerful hold of the witnesses. Thank God they had each other. Mark's doctor had suggested that he take daily walks as part of his recovery. Kimmy already was doing evening strolls, so he starts to join her. On their walks, Mark tells Kimmy he had once planned to be an engineer, that he'd been forced to choose between God and his ambition. Kimmy said she once dreamed of being a doctor or a veterinarian. She revealed she'd always been terrified, also, that having kissed Mark before they were married meant she was going to die in the apocalypse. She was afraid that she and Mark missed their chance to have kids, you know, because they're waiting for the end of the world. Mark, who had started reading so-called apostate material, anything not published by the Watchtower, uh, watching YouTube videos created by former Jehovah's Witnesses who pointed out fallacies and lies from the Watchtower, he starts sharing this info with Kimmy, challenging what she'd been taught, such as the truth about that 1975 doomsday prediction. Inside the Witnesses, their history of constantly fucking up these predictions gets continually covered up. If a witness were to hear this podcast, for example, you know, and, and tell some elders, well, they would get in trouble for listening, but if they wouldn't believe it though, right? I'm a liar, I'm corrupted by Satan, I made it all up. Kimmy had grown up believing that overzealous witnesses, not the Watchtower, chose that date. Nope. Mark, who rarely threw things away, encouraged her to read original old Watchtower articles he had kept since he was a kid, exhorting members of the faith to sell their homes for the 1975 apocalypse, 
Hard to deny that kind of evidence. Now Kimmy was learning that she had been, you know, lied to her whole life. And by August of 2014, Kimmy's faith begins to really unravel. She also began to tell Mark things she'd never told him before, like how her mother would lock her and her siblings in their bedrooms or in the basement for days at a time with no food and a litter box for a toilet. All part of God's plan. Uh, how she would keep them up at night by banging on pots and pans and send them to school delirious and malnourished so that the public school wouldn't corrupt their minds with secular devil knowledge. She was physically abusive uh, to Kimmy's father, who worked long hours, uh, largely unaware of how his wife was also abusing their, uh, their kids. Kimmy's mom used animal cruelty to keep her kids from telling anyone what she was doing. She would drown kittens in the toilet, hang the corpses from a ceiling fan in their bedrooms, place them in a jar by her fucking kids' beds, which the kids interpreted as their mom telling them that she will kill them if they don't do as they're told. What the fuck? It was like maybe instead of Invisible Jesus, uh, maybe her mom was talking to Invisible Jerry Christ, right? Maybe Jerry Christ was giving her giving her mom some, some, some crazy talk. Ah, you can trust me. I was almost a king of heaven for my bro. Freaking stole it from me, gosh dang. Go ahead. Hang the kitten from a fan. No, no, no. My dad gets mad about it. I'll talk to him. Uh, 12 years old, she's brave enough to go to the elders in her congregation and ask for help from her mom's abuse. They tell her that she can't report her mom to the police because it would make the organization look bad. Uh, we went over how much uh, sexual abuse they may have been covering up. How much physical abuse have they been covering up? How much abuse in general are they still covering up? Uh, they discourage her from seeking counseling because a therapist might blame their religion, might get the authorities involved. They're so gross. Finally, the elders ask Kimmy a question. If her mom did end up killing her, could that prevent Jehovah from resurrecting her in the apocalypse anyway? So she says no. And then they tell her just to go home and obey her mom. Oh my God, who cares if your mom kills you? God will bring you back to life in a couple years, tops anyway. What's this big deal? Kimmy went to the elders again at 15 to disclose more physical abuse after she'd been baptized. This time, the elders said they would now need a second eyewitness before they could intervene. If only you and the abuser saw it, nothing we can do, two witness rule. Kimmy offers her brother as a second witness who had also been abused, but she's then told his testimony won't count because he's not a baptized witness. So many fucking loopholes. So determined not to help these victims. Kimmy had heard of the two witness rule before. She assumed it was a peculiar peculiarity of her local congregation. But then Mark tells her it's not. And that it's practiced everywhere and she's fucking horrified. And now she's done. And she'll never attend another meeting either. Excuse me. Both have left the organization now. And of course, they are severely punished. You know, they're shunned. Uh, Mark's witness employees, they all quit. Their witness tenants all move out literally in the middle of the night. Close friends now suddenly pretend to not know them in public, turn their backs to them. Cult, cult, cult. Mark's business, which has been entirely import, uh, supported almost by witnesses, begins to fail. He has no degree or formal education to fall back on. He decides to fight back. He's now determined to learn about the extent of Jehovah Witnesses' abuse. Why? What were they trying so hard to keep hidden? Mark joins Facebook uh, under the pseudonym John Redwood, begins to find other former witnesses with similar stories. As he connects with ex-witnesses around the world, he's struck by how similar their accounts are to his own. He begins writing about his experiences on Facebook, his posts spur conversations with more former witnesses, uh, gives him a new sense of purpose to help people. In the summer of 2015, he and many other ex-witnesses are fascinated by some big Jehovah's Witness hearings in Australia. The investigating commission there had been trying to get testimony from a number or from a member of Watchtower's governing body, uh, which then, you know, consisted of eight men as it does now. Watchtower had managed to avoid a subpoena by claiming that the governing body was just advisory and they played no role in creating policy. Mark, who had obsessively collected Watchtower literature his entire life, had the evidence to prove this was not true. Hail Mark, dude's a fucking hero. He digs out an old copy of the Branch Organization Manual, an obscure document explaining all the functions of the governing body, emails it to Angus Stewart, lead litigator in the proceedings. Stewart uses the manual to subpoena one of the Watchtower's governing body members, a guy named Jeffrey Jackson. In front of the commission, Jackson becomes the first active member of Watchtower's governing body to publicly acknowledge that, quote, child abuse is a problem right now throughout the community. He also admits that in most cases, children who make such charges against the Watchtower are telling the truth. Too bad they didn't throw him in prison for making that admission. How much child abuse did that motherfucker cover up over the years on his watch? Uh, an emotional moment for Mark. He now knew that his knowledge of the Jehovah's Witnesses was good for something other than recruiting other members in the past, bringing more people into a horrible community. Now he's helping people get out. Uh, he's helping justice. In 2017, a Jehovah's Witness man and his girlfriend, partially inspired by Mark, they began walking into random kingdom halls in Massachusetts, opening locked file cabinets with a set of stolen keys and taking out copies of sealed documents. 
They'd heard chatter about Watchtower covering up child abuse. At first, they just wanted to see the evidence themselves, see if it was true or not. Most of the documents they take are letters between local elders and Watchtower headquarters, or from one congregation to another, discussing alleged sins of individual congregants. They find out that one young man was disfellowshipped for stealing candy bars, another for refusing to remove a sign from his van window that said God, uh, that said beating children violates God's law. Uh, they find out that a woman was disfellowshipped for having sex with her ex-husband. Uh, much more troubling, they also gather dozens of letters dealing with accusations of rape, domestic violence, molestation, uh, including several questionnaires required by the 1997 Special Blue Envelope letter. Not knowing what to do with these documents, the man posts a redacted version of one of the letters he had stolen on an ex-Jehovah's Witnesses uh, subreddit. Just five sentences long, the letter informed Watchtower that a ministerial servant had admitted to physically and mentally abusing his wife for years. In the most recent incident, he beat her so badly she had to seek medical attention. Uh, if it were not for her concern over the reproach, it would bring on Jehovah's name. So she was supposed to seek medical attention, but she still didn't. As punishment, the husband was stripped of his rank and he lost special privilege privileges for a little while. He no longer got to handle the microphone at Kingdom Hall meetings. Woohoo! He doesn't get to touch the microphone. He really learned his lesson. Uh, no mention is made of involving the police or taking steps to protect, or to protect the wife because that didn't happen. Mark reached out to the man who mailed in the documents. What Mark read horrified him, uh, but didn't surprise him. Uh, the sins described in the letters range from the mundane smoking pot, marital infidelity, drunkenness, to sexual abuse. One example was a series of letters from a man from Springfield, Massachusetts, who had been disfellowshipped three times, and then they just kept letting him back in. Uh, when the man was once again reinstated in 2008, someone working in a division of Watchtower wrote to his congregation, noting that in 1989, he was said to have allowed his 11-year-old stepdaughter to touch his penis on at least two occasions. Allowed. Like she wanted to, and he finally let her. An investigative journalist later tracked down this girl, now a woman. She told the reporter, he was the adult, I was the kid, I didn't have any choice. It took me two years to go to my mom about it. Her mom immediately went to the congregation's elders, who later called the girl and her stepfather in to pray with them together. Uh, the woman remembered how humiliating that was. Her stepdad was eventually disfellowshipped for instances that involved fornication, drunkenness, lying, according to the letters. But according to the stepdaughter, his alleged molestation of her resulted only in his being privately reproved. A closed door reprimand. He got a tongue lashing and a temporary loss of privileges. He was not allowed to offer comments during Bible study or lead a prayer for a little while. Oh man, not allowed to comment during Bible studies. That'll teach him to force his stepdaughter to touch his dick. Good job, elders. Way to protect your flock, you dumb fucks. Uh, no one went to the police. The girl's mom was encouraged to keep the matter private and uh, no attempt was made to keep the stepfather away from other children. Under his eye, commander, blessed be the fruit. Another series of documents detailed the case of a witness uh, from the Palmer congregation in Brimfield, Massachusetts, who allegedly aggressively and repeatedly sexually abused his two daughters and another young girl. One of the man's daughters said he had tied her down and molested her. Others said he had raped her repeatedly for nine years. He allegedly took one of his daughters into the woods, showed her where he would bury each of her body parts if she ever told. The girl who wasn't his daughter said he raped her in his neighbor's mobile home when she was only four years old. And what did the elders do? I bet you can guess, fucking nothing. At first, they took only nominal action because one of the sisters refused to accuse her father in person. Then in 2003, the elders finally disfellowshipped the man. Oh no, he got disfellowshipped after he confessed to molesting at least one of his daughters. But then he was reinstated a year later, so who gives a shit? They didn't go to the police. Those elders should be in prison with that pedo right now. You know, maybe they didn't want to let the police in because they were doing similar shit. Candace Conti, another person who has spoken out about her suffering at the hands of JW elders. She was raised a witness in Fremont, California. When she was nine, the elders in her congregation paired her with a man named Jonathan Kendrick for Saturday morning field service. Instead of going door to door to preach the word of God, he would take Conti to his house and molest her. And that he, did that, he did that for two years. Years later, after Conti had left the witnesses, she discovered Kendrick's name on a federal sex offender registry. When she went back to the elders in her former congregation to tell them about the abuse, she was rebuffed by the damn two witness rule again. The elders told Conti that without a second witness to the molestation, there's nothing they could do. Conti asked the elders to consider a plan she had devised for tracking child molesters within the organization so this wouldn't happen going forward, and they refused. These godly men refused to help track down child molesters, all part of church policy. Fuck Jehovah's Witnesses. Candace sued Watchtower, her former congregation, and Kendrick, 
Hail Candace Conti. I can't speak for Jesus Michael or Jerry Christ, but Nimrod, Bojangles, Lucifina, and Triple M love the shit out of you. During despositions, the elders admitted that they had long known Kendrick had a history of child molestation. They knew before they paired him with Conti for door-to-door ministry. They paired her with a known pedophile, put the two of them together alone. What the fuck? Those elders, again, should be in prison. Ideally, they should be in prison getting repeatedly raped by their cellmates. And then, you know, they tell the guards what's happening to them. They ask for help. But then when the warden, you know, hears about it, he tells them that, well, unless anyone else saw you being violently sodomized, nothing we can do. We need another witness, which is going to be tough because you share a cell with just your attacker and the guards are not going to fucking pay attention to what goes on there. Uh, 2012, a jury awards Conti $28 million, believed to be the largest jury verdict ever for a single victim in a child abuse case against a religious organization. But then on appeal, it gets reduced to less than 3 million. So better than nothing, I guess. Uh, in the years since, Watchtower has faced dozens of similar lawsuits from victims who say the organization's policies enabled, protected their abusers. Statistically, it appears as if thousands and thousands and thousands of other cases have just not been brought forward yet. Uh, one such lawsuit brought attention to the database. Jose Lopez was seven years old when he was molested by Gonzalo Campos. Uh, yeah, Gonzalo Campos, uh, a, a fellow witness from, or whom the local elders had recommended as a mentor. Despite knowing that Campos was a known pedophile, had a history of molesting young boys. Fucking hate this organization so much. Literally nothing likable about them I can think of at this moment. When Campos assaults Lopez in La Jolla, California uh, in 1986 in his home, the boy tells his mom, who immediately reports Campos to the elders. They say they'll handle the situation and, and, if, uh, and for her to not call the police, and then they don't handle the situation. They just allow him to get away with it. Uh, not only get away with it, he thrives in their organization. He rises in the organization, becomes an elder. In 2010, he flees to Mexico uh, for more accusations. Eventually, he confesses in a disposition to molesting Lopez and several other young boys. Lopez files a lawsuit against Watchtower in 20, or 2012 when his lawyer requested that Watchtower turn over all documents related to Campos and other known molesters. The organization refuses, saying it doesn't have the resources to locate this information, which is bullshit. A senior official for Watchtower whose conscience finally got the best of him later testified that all the information was able to be located easily because it had been scanned, stored in a Microsoft SharePoint database. Still, Watchtower refuses to hand this database over. I hope somebody fucking burns down their headquarters someday. The judge grew frustrated, eventually barred the organization from mounting a defense, hailed that judge, and they hand Lopez a $13.5 million award. Unfortunately, like with Conti, Watchtower lawyers appeal, and an appellate court overturns the ruling, saying the judge should have sanctioned Watchtower incrementally, and the case was settled for an undisclosed sum in January 2018. Fucking dirty lawyering. In almost every one of these cases, pressure to conform and stay silent demanded not only by church officials, but by parents, grandparents, friends, and colleagues, all of whom were so convinced of the righteous path that they believed the act of cutting off their loved ones was a merciful you know, gesture designed to guarantee their eventual salvation. What a way to rationalize sexual abuse. Everyone involved in these cover-ups should be so fucking ashamed of themselves and embarrassed to think that some all-knowing and supposedly loving and forgiving God would want them to ever behave that way. Back to Mark and his leaked documents now. January 9th, 2018, the documents go live on Faith Leaks. Gizmodo publishes a story. Other American outlets pick it up, as, as do media in the UK, Finland, Spain, Lebanon, Hungary, Chile, uh, Bolivia, other countries. Mark plans to send the documents describing serious crimes to relevant local authorities. Uh, he receives messages from people saying that uh, they had more documents to share with him. Six months after the leaks go public, Mark receives a call from his mom. Hadn't spoken with him in more than a year. His father was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, treatment not going well. His parents are still in the, uh, the kingdom. He and Kimmy immediately become involved in his parents' lives, doing their grocery shopping, driving his dad to radiation treatments, managing his care. For the first time in his adult life, Mark grows close to his parents. Kimmy becomes a daughter to them. In January 2019, Mark's father dies. At the funeral, Mark finds himself once again sitting in a Baltimore kingdom hall. Though he and Kimmy had, to their great surprise, still not been disfellowshipped, they did not know what to expect. Both to become vocal Watchtower critics online, no longer bothered to hide their identities. Still, there's an unwritten rule among witnesses that funerals are a no-shun zone. So that's good. Maybe the most likable detail I've come across about them. They were mostly greeted warmly. Uh, glad to see some old friends. The elder given the eulogy spoke of Jerry O'Donnell's ever-present smile and endearing habit of obsessive record-keeping. Mark even able to extend a little bit of forgiveness towards his parents. Realizing the pressure he'd face from the witness community would, was also put on his parents. He told a journalist, you have to remember, they were talked into this too. 
The story of these abused ex-members seeking retribution continues. It'll probably keep continuing for quite some time. In February 2020, the BBC reported that at least 20 former Jehovah's Witnesses currently suing the group over historical sexual abuse. I hope these cases win landslide settlements. I hope those settlements embolden more and more victims to come forward. I hope it all snowballs into a massive avalanche of litigation and ideally criminal prosecutions of sexual offenses. And I hope it brings down this insane doomsday obsessed child molesting kingdom down. Ah, uh, I, I, I don't want a second coming. Maybe God can just come down and smite the leadership of the witnesses. Just, just send down Jerry to fuck him up. Jehovah's Witnesses, what a strange religion. No, strange is not a strong enough word. What a terrible religion. That's, it's garbage to give up so much of your time to knock on people's doors, feel bad about damn near everything, help cover up abusers, study a bunch of nonsensical watchtower society doctrine, and for what? So you can have a tiny chance of going to heaven after some supposed rapture? If you're listening and you're in this group, do yourself a huge favor and get the fuck out. DareToDoubt.org. DareToDoubt.org is one of the many nonprofits dedicated to helping members get out and stay out and figure out how to succeed in life once this terrible organization has shunned you. Contact them secretly. Let former members who have gotten out help you navigate your escape. Let them, you know, help you feel safe getting out. They've been where you are now. Don't waste more of your life in this madness. The Jehovah's Witnesses are a fucking cult and a hateful, dangerous one. I like them less than Scientology now, and I really don't like Scientology. If the Jehovah's Witnesses had it their way, they would live in a completely separate society. They'd operate, you know, uh, outside of any secular nation, have their own theocratic, you know, just monstrous nation, some, some Gilead from The Handmaid's Tale. How many kids would get abused and molested in that nation? How many wives would be beaten? Scary to think about. And all unpunished. Right. As always, there's so much more we could get into. The witnesses certainly are a fascinating and troubling group, but I, I think I dug into them enough today. So much more destructive than I ever imagined. I thought the worst thing they did was annoyingly knock on people's doors. Turns out that's one of the least, uh, you know, unlikable things they've done and continue to do. Let's head now to today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Jehovah's Witnesses are a large group of people, over 8 million worldwide if the Watchtower sets, uh, stats are to be believed, who believe primarily in the imminent Armageddon, in which 144,000 special people will be taken to heaven, and the rest of the believers will get to live the rest of their mortal lives in a paradise on earth before they die and become dust and exist spiritually no more. Watchtower has made so many predictions regarding when Armageddon will happen, 1878, 1914, 1938, 1975, 2000, others, on and on and on, and it still hasn't happened. But so many people have sold homes, businesses, cashed in insurance policies, and more because they were told over and over that it was all coming to an end. Number two, the Jehovah's Witnesses have many strange beliefs. Two of them that haven't exactly endeared them to a lot of people are their refusal to, uh, refusal to serve in the military or take or donate blood. Number three, uh, the Watchtower may be sitting on the largest database of reported instances of sexual abuse of all time. Not all of the records have been made public. They've strongly fought anyone that tries to make them public. But a few whistleblowers, including ex-witness Mark O'Donnell, have done their best to make some of the documents public. While other victims of sexual abuse have come forward with their stories and continue to seek justice, not in front of a heartless group of deluded elders, but in an actual court that will punish predators. Number four, Jehovah's Witnesses are a fucking cult. They demand hours upon hours of service, control the lives of their members, constantly beat that doomsday drum, and if they had it their way, would have their own separate society where they didn't have to follow anything other than their own horrific, twisted, misguided notions of justice. Number five, new info. Did you know that Prince was Jehovah's Witness? Yep. The famously sexually charged Purple Rain singer became a Jehovah's Witness. And he was for a long time, actually. Prince's fans immediately confused when news of Prince's conversion broke in 2001. How do you reconcile your hedon you know, uh, hedonic icon in a rubber thong with a faith that doesn't just frown upon gay marriage, but also prohibits oral and anal sex. The answer might go back to his childhood. He was raised in a chaotic home, uh, but his parents were members of the Seventh-day Adventists, another socially conservative end times focused group. As we learned, Jehovah's Witnesses morphed out of Adventism. It apparently seemed to Prince that the Jehovah's Witness faith helped explain the growing social injustice he felt he saw all around him. When Mark Brown interviewed Prince in 2004 for the Rocky Mountain News, Prince told Brown he was interested in spirituality and answers not strange ceremonies or theories. I'm very practical, said Prince. You go Trekkie on me, I got to go. Okay. Uh, when he left, Prince gave Mark a Jehovah's Witness pamphlet, told him to call him day or night. 
It was a little uncomfortable for me, but it was very important to him, says Brown. It got pretty intense. Prince was introduced to the faith by Larry Graham, bassist for Sly and the Family Stone, another group known for sexual music. What the fuck? Prince even went door to door a little bit in Los Angeles, Minneapolis, handing out pamphlets on salvation. What a surreal experience to have the guy who wrote the lyrics to Lil Nicky show up at your door and try and convert you to the Jehovah's Witnesses. That song opens with, I knew a girl named Nikki. I guess you could say she was a sex fiend. I met her in a hotel lobby, masturbating with the magazine. Clearly no one told Prince that even coming on a pillow in your sleep is sinful. Oh my heck, Prince, what the frick? Uh, guessing that Prince donated enough and brought enough watchtower exposure that maybe they bent the rules a little bit for him. Uh, he was a Jehovah's Witness from 2001 until his death in 2016, known as Brother Nelson to the fellow witnesses at a kingdom hall in the Minneapolis suburb of St. Louis Park where apparently he studied the Bible with them weekly for years. And not the only celebrity to be a witness, Michael Jackson was a witness for a few years in the mid 80s. Uh, that one kind of makes sense actually. I mean, come on. He probably joined because of the two witness rule. Uh, Venus and Serena Williams raised as witnesses and still are, I believe, the tennis stars. Uh, at least as recently as 2018. What the fuck? Stand up for all those victims. Use your high profiles to demand some accountability. I don't know. Because their religion is terrible, I guess it doesn't mean they're terrible. Uh, what, what did I say earlier? I can hate the belief, but love the believer. Better hold on to that one, I guess. It's not like they're elders or members of the governing body. I don't know. Let's, let's get out of here, you dirty pillow humpers. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Jehovah's Witnesses have been sucked. I hope you were fascinated even, even half as much as I was, and it would have been entertaining. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making Time Suck every week. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, doing so much. Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, the script keeper, Zach Flannery, uh, doing all the initial digging on uh, this week's research. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, actually, uh, nope. Ha ha, Sophie, Sophie, fact source was Evans. Just, uh, uh, anyway, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Zach, for doing so many other things. Uh, thanks to Bitelixer for continuously refining the Time Suck app. Logan, the art warlock, Keith, our creative director, running badmagicmerch.com and more. Thanks to Liz, the enchantress Hernandez, who runs our Cult of the Curious Facebook private page. Currently called to the Curious 2 with her all seen eyes moderators and helping Logan with socials. Uh, thanks for helping curate an awesome online community, everyone. Thanks to Beefsteak and the Mod Squad running Discord. You can link to the uh, Discord group through the Time Suck app. Uh, next week, we return again to true crime with the freeway killer, Bill Bonin. After being arrested in June of 1980, Bonin confessed to abducting, raping, killing 21 boys and young men, expressed no remorse, only embarrassment and regret over having been caught. He openly admitted he wanted to keep killing. Told a reporter who asked him what he would be doing if he were still at large, I'd still be killing. I couldn't stop killing. It got easier with each one we did. And yes, he said we. He had not one but four accomplices that helped him with most of his murders. His murder spree was short, roughly a year, but highly active in that year. Suspected of killing at least 36 people. Looked like the stereotype of a creepy serial killer. A creepy white dude with a mustache prowling around in an old Ford Econoline van pulling over, grabbing teens off the side of the road, horrifically torturing them. The freeway killer. Next week, it gets real fucking dark. But now, let's keep it relatively light and suck on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Let's start with some laughs. Uh, and then we'll end on Savannah's Jehovah's Witness message. Uh, right now, humiliated sucker Chrissy P. Pants is wishing hellfire upon me. I get it. He writes, <laughs> you should set yourself on fucking fire. It'd be better for everyone. Hello, my former favorite podcast host. Here's a story. I was walking through my local grocery store and listening to your dumb podcast on my earphones. Spe <laughs> specifically the Robin Williams suck. I was at the back of the store when you started talking about goodwill hunting. All of a sudden you start yelling like an asshole about how anyone who doesn't go on to one of the best schools is stupid. And I start to laugh a bit. Then you start screaming about babies and diapers. And by the time you got to, you should set yourself on fucking fire. I started fucking pissing my pants, you bitch. I don't know if you know the layout of grocery stores, fucker, but the bathrooms are in front. So now I'm running with piss dripping down my leg and onto the floor, leaving a motherfucking trail. Are you listening? A piss trail. While I'm running and scream laughing like a fucking lunatic from the milk all the way to the goddamn registers, I shop here weekly, asshole. Anywho, I absolutely love Time Suck. But also, go fuck yourself, Chris. <laughs> Chris, thank you for sharing your humiliation with us all. Uh, bad for you. Lots of smiles and laughs for us. Uh, I think you're going to have to find a new grocery store. Probably forever, but at least for a few months. 
I hope this and last week's episodes were enjoyed piss-free. And now some inspiration. Super committed to recovery sucker C.J. Domler is turning his ship around. I love it. C.J. writes, I'm not one for grand introductions, so here goes, oh, holy master of time suck. I'm an avid listener to everything Bad Magic. Been a fan of your comedy for years, though I must say time suck is absolutely my favorite. Uh, also, as a side note, I love uh, when you've mentioned uh, Ayn Rand, my favorite author, and Guns, Germs, and Steel. Uh, cool. Uh, but on to the point, I want to let you know that through all of the episodes and every show, I finally pushed myself to do something I never could do before. I self-admitted to an alcohol recovery center for inpatient therapy to deal with my alcoholism as a 23-year-old and finally, hopefully, find a way to deal with depression and anxiety. I was drowning myself in a fifth of liquor on an almost nightly basis, and I hit a breaking point. You talking about getting help when we need it and Lindsay advocating for he uh, so heavily for finding help pushed me to do what I needed to do. I was just released from a detox center and going to be staying in rehab for a while and trying to stay caught up with bad magic shows. And I'm going to be. Uh, I have a long journey ahead of me, a lot of pain and strife, but I feel lucky knowing I'll have bad magic products as a brief respite from it all. I just want you to all know how much laughter and joy and knowledge your shows have brought me over the last year. Love the show. We'll always listen whenever I can. You're soon to be hopefully sober time sucker, CJ. CJ, awesome work, man. Love that you're taking charge of your life. Uh, obviously, I've advocated for legalizing you know, drug use, uh, but that doesn't mean I think drugs, including alcohol, are for everyone. Science shows they are not. And if they're not for you, yeah, stay the fuck away from them and enjoy so much of the rest of the, what the wonderful world has to offer. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best. Uh, CJ, stay clean. Make some noise. Rumble, young man, rumble. And now for an anonymous message. A concerned sucker writes, Hey, Dan, I need some help here, and I really don't know what to do. My brother-in-law is deep into conspiracy theories. You name it, he's into it. He mainly talks about flat earth and vaccines, conspiracies, but like I said, talks about a lot more. The guy is, is in his early 20s. I want to help pull him out of it as gently as, as I can. His family is currently living with us due to circumstances. I'd like to stay anonymous if you decide to put this on the suck for the sake of this not getting back to him somehow. I just want to help bring him out of these crazy ideas and back to logic and reason. Anything you can give me, will most likely help and help others bring their family and friends out of, the, out of this madness. Hail Nimrod. Thanks for everything you do, sir. Wish you well. Three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. Anonymous. Well, anonymous sucker. Sorry to hear about your brother-in-law. Uh, sounds like he, he's drank the conspiracy Kool-Aid that far too many people are drinking today. I will share some advice I found on a BBC article. And I think this is really good. Uh, first, stay calm. Don't go off about them, you know, like I do uh, here on the podcast to their face. It's just going to push them away. No one likes to be called stupid. It's just going to make them double down on their beliefs. Conspiracy belief is based not in logic, but in emotion, you know, in feelings of resentment, anger, indignation of, uh, over how the world is working, you know, uh, not to their liking. Uh, two, don't be dismissive. Hear them out. You know, hear him out. Approach his beliefs with empathy, not with ridicule. Again, do not do what I do here. Three, encourage critical thinking. Ask him why he doesn't apply the skepticism he employs against experts with the people he does believe. Why trust who he trusts? Ask a lot of questions. Get him to apply his own conspiratorial logic towards the people he believes. Uh, yeah, and four is just questions. Questions are better than assertions. Uh, come from a place of trying to understand him, not just tell him what's right and what's wrong. And lastly, and this is a big one, is patience. If you can pull him out, big if, unfortunately, it's going to take time in all likelihood. Trade information with him. Agree to look into his sources if he'll look into yours and discuss it and do that over and over and over. And then hopefully, uh, you know, if he ever gets ready, maybe talk him into listening to one of my uh, sarcastic ass conspiracy episodes when he's ready. Good luck. I hope it helps. And last update, this is Savannah, uh, the person that put this uh, uh, group of Jehovah's Witnesses on, on our radar, this loving, fantastic, and concerned mate Zach writes, I've been a long time listener to Time Suck, and I greatly appreciate the time and research spent on your podcast. I'm hoping that maybe you can help or at least take a glance at a subject that has destroyed mine and many of those that I love. Uh, something that destroys families, allows rape and child abuse, encourages shunning, and promotes domestic abuse. I'm talking of Jehovah's Witnesses. This religion or cult, depending on view, digs its fingers into every aspect of life. From what you do with your body, i.e. giving blood, receiving blood, or life-saving measures, tattoos, piercings, what you can and can't wear, who you can and can't talk to, this cult makes it known that there are only two sides, with or against. No questions. I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. My parents still are. I was a child of sexual abuse by a family within the Jehovah's Witness community, as well as many I know, and it is something hushed and never spoken of. But if you do speak of it, you're a liar and ostracized. The Witnesses have a very simple rule stemming from can, uh, canonical beliefs. 
Uh, two witnesses must witness an action or the action never truly transpired. If a child or wife try to reach for help, they are threatened to not go to the police. They get asked if two people were witnessed to the event in question. If two witnesses were not present, it never happened. They still insist, uh, they still, or, oh, I'm sorry. They then instill doubt amongst family and friends until you confess that it never happened or choose to leave the congregation and leave everything and everyone you've known. This cycle repeats over and over, forcing many into suicide, uh, fearing expulsion from the church. You are left with only one real option, and that is to remain silent. Videos are produced by the ruling caste promoting shunning as a gift of love to bring back former members or excommunicated members to the fold. This gift of love has taken many lives and will continue until attention is brought to this organization. Lawsuits have been filed and won in other countries over these actions, but mostly in America, uh, most in America are completely oblivious to this happening. After listening to your recent podcast about the LDS Church and hearing the depth in which you research every aspect of the church, I was prompted to write and request an episode regarding the Jehovah's Witnesses. I truly believe that you are one of the only ones who can do this topic justice and expose them and their corrupt teachings. Thank you for your time, Savannah. Well, Savannah, first off, I fucking love your name. Savannah is one of my favorite names. Uh, makes me think of like a Southern debutante or something. It's fancy in a good way. Uh, second, I hope I did this episode the justice that you and other victims uh, deserve, you know? I hope you are able to someday get your family out of this sad and yes, very destructive cult. I hope the lawsuits you speak of, as I said earlier, bring them down someday. Hail you for being strong enough to get out. What a major accomplishment. I hope you're kicking so much fucking ass. I hope, you, I hope you're wearing the tightest of tight pants. Hail Lucifina, hail Nimrod, and hail you Savannah. Let's get out of here. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks again for listening to this Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meat Sacks. Thanks for five fantastic years. Please do not shun any family or friends this week because some deluded dumb fuck elders think that's what an angry god wants you to do. Just put on some tight ass pants and keep on sucking. <laughs> Bad Magic Productions. <laughs> hey, uh, what a good looking and righteous crowd we have here in Heaven's Joke Joint. I uh, got some great jokes for you. Uh, nice, clean, non offensive stuff. Uh, what was Moses' wife, Zephora, known as when she'd throw dinner parties? The hostess with the Moses. Ho <laughs> What do you call a biblical character who is just pulled into church? A parking lot. <laughs> One more. What did pirates call Noah's boat? The Ark, matey. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Try the veal. Jerry Christ says it's divine. <laughs>